Okay, now let's have a look on a social engineering plugin that will allow us to steal usernames and passwords for accounts. So basically the way this works is it'll dim the screen and it'll tell the person that you got logged out of your session, so please log in to your account again so you can get authenticated. So this will allow us to bypass HTTPS, HSTS, all, all the security that's used by the target account page. For example, if you're trying to get username and password for Facebook, then you'll be able to bypass all the security that Facebook uses because you're, what you're doing is you're actually just showing a fake Facebook page. So the user will never actually get in contact with Facebook. So let's just click on this. And you'll see that you can click from here, you can click what account that you want to hijack. So let's say we're going with Facebook and you can select what the backlight will be. So we're just leaving that as gray and we're gonna execute this. And we go when we go to our target, you'll see that they're being told that they got logged out of their session. So please log in with your username and password. So I'm gonna put my username as Zaid. Then I'm gonna put my password as one, two, three, four, five, six. Hit enter. And if we go back here, you'll see that we got our username was Zaid and the password was one, two, three, four, five, six. So you can use this to hijack a number of accounts. For example, um, let's just have another example. If we go with YouTube, again, you give it an execute, come back, you see the YouTube logo, and you can try to log in, put a username, password, sign in, and that will be captured. So again, this is a really good way of gaining access to accounts because even if the user is not planning on logging into the account that you're trying to steal, then you'll kind of force them to enter their username and password to get to, to be logged back in into their account, and then you'll be able to capture the username and the password. In this lecture, we're gonna learn how to generate an undetectable backdoor. A backdoor is just a file that's when executed on the target computer, it'll give us full access to that computer. So it'll basically allow us to hack it and do anything that we want on that computer. There's a number of ways to generate backdoors and what we're interested in is to generate a backdoor that is not detectable by antivirus programs. Now this is not very hard to achieve as you'll see and we're gonna do this using a tool called Vil Framework. Now I already have Vil's project page open in here I'm going to include its link in the resources of this lecture on the top left. Now, if you're not familiar with Git, this is a version control system that allows programmers to host, share, and update their programs. So, to download something from GitHub, all you have to do is click on the green button in here, copy this link, and then go to Terminal, navigate to the location where you want to download this project, and in this example, I want to go to opt. This is the directory where you should be installing optional software. And if I do ls, you will see I only have one directory in here called teeth. So to download vil in here, all you have to do is first of all, write the git command, which is git. And what we want to do is we want to clone a repository. And the link for this repository is the link that we copied in here from the green button. So I'm just gonna paste it here. So a very, very simple command. We're using git to download a repository from git. We're saying that I want to clone this repository and the link of the repository that I want to clone is this one. So if I hit enter now, you'll see it's gonna download it for me. And once it's done, if we do ls, You'll see we have a new directory called vil, and we can navigate to this directory by doing cd vil. And in here, if I list, you'll see we have a number of files, but the main file for the program is this one, vil.py. But we can't run this file right now because we still didn't install this tool. Now, Vil relies on a large number of libraries and third-party programs. So you're going to have to install all of these first before you can use it. 
Now luckily, you don't have to do this manually because Vil comes with an installation script. Now this script is placed in the config directory, so we have to navigate in this directory first. So we'll do cd config. And if we list here, you'll see we have a file called setup.sh. Now as the name suggests, if you run this file, it will install all the needed libraries and third-party applications that Vail uses. So to run an sh or a bash file from the terminal, all you have to do is type dot forward slash followed by the file name and in our case it's called setup.sh. Now you can run the setup as is like this, but I want to add two arguments to this. The first argument that I want to add is the dash dash silent. This argument will run the installer as an unattended installer. So basically it'll install everything with its default settings and it won't ask us to configure anything. The next argument that I want to add is the dash dash force. So that in case you're running this a second time, if you already installed Vail and something went wrong and you're installing it again, the force argument will overwrite any existing installations. Now I didn't just figure out these arguments myself. If you actually read the description here on the project page, you'll learn exactly how to install it and what each of these arguments do. So I'm gonna hit enter now. And as you can see now, it's going to automatically gather information about my current operating system. It's going to install the needed libraries and the needed applications. This might take some time because it's gonna download a lot of packages. So please be patient and give it its time. Now I'm going to pause the video because this is gonna take some time and I'll continue recording once it's done. So, Right now, as you can see, the installation is finished and it's telling me that everything is done. So I can run the tool now, but what I'm actually gonna do is I'm gonna first close this terminal window and open a new window just to show you how you would start it by default. Cause usually when you open terminal, you'll actually be in the root directory. So if I do pwd right now, you'll see I am in root. So in order to run Vail, we have to first navigate to the location where you downloaded it. And we downloaded it to the opt directory. So we're gonna do cd opt vil. Now, if we do ls, you'll see we have the file that I told you that's the file for the program. And we have the config directory where we were and where we ran the installer. Now, we've already installed everything, so we don't need to run the installer. And to run vil, all we have to do is type dot forward slash followed by the program name, which is vil.py. I'm gonna hit enter. And as you can see, the program is working with no issues at all. Now in the next lectures, I'm gonna show you how to use this program to generate undetectable backdoors that can be used to hack Windows computers. Okay, now that we have vil loaded, you can see it show us the main commands that you can use with Vil. So the first command is you can do exit to exit. You can do info to get information about a specific tool. You can do list to list the available tools. You can do update to update Vil. And this is very, very important because you always wanna be up to date when it comes to bypassing antivirus programs. And then you can do use to use a tool. Now, let's start using Vil Evasion, and as we do it, it's gonna become so easy and you'll be able to understand it more. Now, Vil has two main tools, and if we do a list, you'll be able to see them. So, we have the first one, which is the one that we're interested in, which is called Evasion, and that's the one that generates undetectable backdoors for us. And then there's the second one, which is called Ordnance. And this tool generates the payloads that's used by evasion. So you can look at this as a helper or a secondary tool. Now, what I mean by a payload is a payload is the part of the code of the backdoor that does the stuff that we want, that does the evil stuff, if you want to say. 
So it's the part of the code that give us a reverse connection. It's the part of the code that download and execute something on the target computer. It's the, the part of the code that allow us to achieve what we want by executing that file. And this is going to become more clear as we start using Vil. Now for now we're interested into using evasion. So we're going to do use one because that's the first tool. That's number one. And as you can see, we have Vil Evasion loaded now. And as I said before, this used to be a standalone tool that you just downloaded on its own. But now they have it all combined together. Now, as you can see, the first thing that we get when we load Vil Evasion is the commands that you can run on this tool. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to list to see all the available payloads. And as you can see, we have 41 different payloads. And all of these payloads follow a certain naming pattern. And you can see, for example, let's take this example right here because that's the payload that I'm going to be using. You can see the payload is divided into three parts. The first part right here refers to the programming language that the payload is going to be wrapped in. So we have the evil code. And then the evil code is going to be wrapped into a certain programming language that the target computer understands. And right here, you can see that this payload uses Go programming language. We can see this one uses C. We can see these ones use CS. We have Python, we have PowerShell, and we have Ruby if we scroll down. The second part of the payload is really important. This is the type of the payload, the type of the code that's going to be executed on the target computer. In this example, we're using Meterpreter, which is a payload designed by Metasploit. Metasploit is a huge framework for hacking and it allows you to do a lot of things. But in this lecture, we're focusing on creating a payload called Meterpreter. And what's really cool about Meterpreter is it runs in the memory and it allows us to migrate between system processes. So we can have the payload or the backdoor running from a normal process like Explorer, for example, and this payload will allow us to gain full control over the target computer. So we'll be able to navigate through the file system, download, upload files, turn on the mic, turn on the webcam, even use that computer to hack other computers, install a keylogger. You can literally do anything you can think of. And all of this will be running from the memory from a normal process on the system. So it's very hard to detect and it doesn't leave a lot of footprints. That's why it's a really, really cool payload and we'll be using it a lot. The third part of the name is the method that's going to be used to establish the connection. So in here, you can see that this is called rev HTTPS. So rev st stands for reverse and HTTPS is the protocol that's going to be used to establish the connection. So we can see that this payload will create a reverse HTTPS connection. You can see this one right here, for example, it creates a reverse HTTP connection. And we have this one in here that creates a reverse TCP connection. Now, what I mean by reverse is the connection is going to come from the target computer to my own computer. So I won't be connecting to the computer that I want to hack. What's going to happen is once the person double clicks the backdoor, the backdoor will connect back to me from the target computer. What's cool about this is I'll be able to bypass antivirus programs because the connection is not going to the target computer. It's coming back to my computer. So it's literally as if the target person is just connecting to a normal website. I'm going to use a port that websites use, which is 80 or 8080. So again, if the person analyzes the connection, it will look as if they're literally just connecting to a normal website. Also, if the target computer is hidden behind a router or behind a network, again, this is going to work because the connection is coming from the target computer to me instead of me connecting to the target computer. So using a reverse connection is really, really handy. And I think this is really the only practical way of gaining access to a computer because there is a lot of things that can stop you from connecting to a certain computer. Now, this is the general naming pattern. You'll see some payloads like this one right here, which doesn't follow that general naming pattern. 
And basically what these payloads do, for example, you can see this one is called shell code inject. So what it's going to do is it's going to create a payload that injects your other payload. So it's going to cre create a normal payload and that normal payload injects a interpreter payload, for example. Now it does this to try to bypass more security, but usually they won't bypass more things than the normal payloads would bypass. So that's why I usually just use one of the normal payloads in here. So this is it. This is all about the payloads. Sorry I took a bit of time, but I wanted to make sure that you guys understand the naming pattern. I wanted you to understand what a payload is and the difference between a reverse and a bind and a TCP payload. This way, you, the rest of the course will become more clear to you and I can just use the payload that I want without explaining what it is. Now in the next lecture, we're going to be generating a payload and we'll be testing it against antivirus programs. Okay, so in this video, we're going to be using Vil to create a backdoor. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do list to list the available tools. And I'm going to use number one because we want to use evasion. And then I'm going to list my payloads. And like I said in the previous lecture, I want to use go interpreter reverse HTTPS. So that's number 15. So I'm going to do use 15. And that's going to list the, first of all, it's going to show me information about this particular payload. And then it'll show me the options that I can set for this payload. So the main option that you want to set and the most important one is the IP address. So this is the IP address, which you're going to be receiving the connections on. As we said, we're going to have a reverse connection and we need to set the IP address, which the payload or the backdoor will try to connect back to. And in our case, we want to receive the connection back to this Kali machine. So we're going to set the IP L host to the IP address of the current Kali machine. Now to get the IP of my Kali machine, I have to run if config. So I'm going to split the screen by doing right click and click on split horizontally. And I'm just going to bring this down a bit. And we're going to run if config. Now you can see the IP address in here is 10 20 14 213. This is the IP of my Kali machine. This is the IP of the machine that I'm using as the attacking machine. So this is where I want the connection to come back to so I can hack the target computer once the backdoor is executed. So I'm going to set L host to 10, 20, 14, 213. So you can set any of these options using the set command. So all you have to do is write set followed by the option that you want to change. So in this case, we want to change the L host and we want to change that to 10, 20, 14, 213. Now the L port is set to 80, which is really good because that's the port that's used by web servers. So as I said, the connection will look as if the target person is connecting to a website and it's not going to be suspicious. But I don't want to use that port because I'll have a web server running on this and we'll talk about that later. So I'm going to change that to 8080. 8080 is another port that's used by web servers. So it's still not suspicious and it should still bypass firewalls. So I'm just going to do set. Same way that we did it before with the L host, we're going to do L port to the value that we want to set this option to and we're going to set it to 8080. Now, if I do options again to list all the options, you'll see that the L host changed to 10, 20, 14, 213, and the L port changed to 80, 80. Now, if you generate the backdoor like this, you will bypass all antivirus programs except AVG. I've already tried this. That's how I know this. And that's not good enough because we want to bypass everything. Now, the way antivirus programs work is they have a very large database of signatures. These signatures correspond to files that contain har harmful code. So what they do is they compare the signature of your file, of your backdoor, to all the files in this huge database. 
If your file matches any of these files, then they'll flag it as a virus or as malware. If it doesn't, then they'll think that it's a normal file and it's not malware. So, the main point in here is we're gonna try to modify the file, our backdoor, as much as possible to make it more unique so that it bypasses the signature database and will be able to bypass antivirus programs. Now, as I said, Vil is already doing that for us. It's encrypting the backdoor, it's obfuscating it, it's injecting it in the memory so that it doesn't get detected, and it's doing a good job at it. It's bypassing pretty much everything except for only one antivirus program. So just to bypass this last antivirus program, I'm gonna set some optional options that really won't do much of a difference. They'll just make the backdoor look a bit different. So the first thing that I'm gonna modify is processors. And that's the minimum number of processors to be used by the backdoor. I'm not going to set a huge number because that will just make my backdoor not work. I'm just going to set it to 1, which is pretty much nothing really. But I'm just going to set this option to make the code look a bit different. So I'm going to do set. Again, the same way that we are setting the L port and the L host, we're just going to put the option name, which is processors. And we're going to set that to number 1. And I'm also going to set another option, which is the sleep option. And that basically lets the backdoor sleep for a number of seconds that you set before it executes the evil code that you have in there, before it executes the payload. So I'm going to set this to 6. Again, no real reason for this. I'm only doing this to make the backdoor look a bit different. So I'm going to do set sleep to 6. So I'm going to hit enter. And I'm going to do options again to make sure that all the options are set the way I want them to be. So I have my IP address set properly. I have my L port. I have my processors. And I have my sleep. So I'm going to generate the backdoor. And now it's asking me to name this backdoor something. So I'm going to name this backdoor rev. HTTPS 8080 just so that we can remember which payload and which port to use for this backdoor in the future. Now the backdoor is generated and you can see it's telling us the module that's used and it's telling us where the backdoor is stored. So the backdoor is stored in this path right here. So I'm going to copy that. Let's go ahead and check to see if the backdoor is detected by any antivirus programs. Now you can use the built-in feature by Vil using the check vt command, but this feature only uses the signature of the file and it's not 100% accurate. Sometimes it tells you that the file will bypass all antiviruses, but it'll actually be detected. You can also use VirusTotal, but I don't recommend that and please don't do that because if you do that, your backdoor will become less effective because VirusTotal share the results of their scans with antivirus programs. What we're going to do is we're going to use a website called No Distribute. So we're going to go to it now. So I'm just going to Google for No Distribute. And what this is going to do, it's similar to VirusTotal. The only difference is it's not going to share the scan results with antivirus programs. So it won't affect your backdoor. So I'm going to click on browse to navigate to my file and I'm just going to copy where the file is stored. So Vil is telling me now it's stored in this location in user share will output compiled. So I'm going to copy this and I'm going to come here. I'm going to click on the pen and I'm going to paste the location. I'm going to click on open and scan the file. Now, as you can see, I've already scanned this file and it's telling me that this file has been scanned before. So I'm just going to click on view previous results. And as you can see, the file is actually scanned on the same day as today, which is the 29th of March, 2017. And as you can see, the file is bypassing all antivirus programs. So we can use this backdoor against any device and we'll be sure that the device or the computer will not be able to detect this file as a virus. Now there's a few things to keep in mind. 
Antivirus programs always update their database and they'll always update their code as well. So you want to always make Vil up to date. Also, sometimes with the same exact backdoor, it might get detected and it might not get detected because depending on the way the backdoor is getting encrypted and it's getting generated. I've actually generated this backdoor before with sleep of with no sleep and as i said it got it got detected by one antivirus program i generated with 10 seconds and it still got detected and then with six it was able to bypass it so you want to keep playing around with the options you want to keep playing around with the payloads until you manage to achieve the best results so that you can bypass as much antivirus programs as possible Now, the backdoor that we created uses a reverse payload. So, like I said before, it does not open a port in the target computer. It actually connects from the target computer to our computer. And by doing that, it'll bypass firewalls and it'll look less suspicious. So, for this to work, we need to open a port in our computer so that the backdoor can connect from the target computer to us on that port. So, if you remember, when I created the backdoor, I set the port to 8080. So, I need to open that port in my Kali machine so that when the target person executes the backdoor, the backdoor can connect back to me on port 8080. So, I'm just going to write the name of the payload that we used because that's very important when you're listening for incoming connections. So, we used a payload that's written in Go and that was a meterpreter rev HTTPS, which is a reverse HTTPS payload. Now, this is not a command. I'm just going to write it in here. So, just that you keep this in mind. And we used port 8080 for the reverse connection. So, these are the most important things to keep in mind when listening for incoming connections. So, I'm going to split the screen. And I'm going to listen for incoming connections in here. And to do that, I'm going to use the Metasploit framework. Now, to run Metasploit, all you have to do is just run MSF console. Now, Metasploit framework is a huge framework for penetration testing. So, the meterpreter backdoor or the meterpreter payload that Will created for us is actually programmed by the people who made Metasploit. That's why we're using Metasploit to listen for incoming connections. So, Will Evasion actually uses Metasploit to generate the backdoor that we chose in the previous video. So, to listen for incoming connections, we're going to use a module in Metasploit. Now, Metasploit, as I said, is a huge framework and it has a lot of modules. So, the module that we're interested in is a module that allows us to listen for incoming connections from a meterpreter payload. To use that module, we're going to do use, to use a module, and then we're going to specify the module name. And the module name is exploit multi handler. Okay, so the command we're using is use to specify the module that we want to use. And we're using a module called exploit multi handler that allow us to listen for incoming connections. I'm going to hit enter. And I was already in that module. So you can see that nothing changed for me. But for you, you should navigate to that module. And I'm going to do show options. To see the options that I can set for this module. And you can see that you can specify different options for it. The most important thing that you want to specify is the payload. So you can see in here for me, it's set to Windows Meterpreter Reverse TCP. And if you remember what we used, we used a Meterpreter Reverse HTTPS, not TCP. So you want to change this. The first part is fine because our target is going to be Windows, but you want to change the reverse TCP to reverse HTTPS. And you can change that exactly the same way that we did with Vil Evasion. So you type in set, you put the option name that you want to change, and we want to change the option for the payload. So we're going to say payload. 
and we're gonna set that to Windows Meterpreter reverse HTTPS this time. Okay, so we're doing set to set an option. We're setting the payload to Windows Meterpreter reverse HTTPS. Now this payload so should correspond to the payload that you chose in the backdoor. So in the backdoor we used Meterpreter reverse HTTPS. That's why in here we're using reverse HTTPS as well. If you chose reverse HTTP, then set this to reverse HTTP. If you use reverse TCP, then set this to reverse TCP and so on. So I'm gonna hit enter for this and that's gonna do it for me. And if I do show options now, you'll see the payload changed to Windows Meterpreter Reverse HTTPS. Now the same concept applies for all the other options. So you want to set the L host to our IP address. And you can see that this is already set to the right one. So if it was wrong for you, all you have to do is just do set L host and put your IP address. So you can get the IP address using ifconfig like I showed you in the previous lecture. So for me it's 10, 20, 14, 2, 13. And again, this is the same IP that I used when I created my backdoor. And same goes for the port, you wanna set the same port. So we're gonna do set, L port to 8080 because that's the port that we used when we generated the backdoor. So again, the main idea with this is you want to set the payload, the L host and the port to exactly the same options that you chose when you created the backdoor. Once done with that, we're going to do show options one more time. And you'll see that I have my payload set properly, Windows Meterpreter Reverse HTTPS. I have my L host and I have my L port. And all of that is done properly. So all we have to do now is just do exploit. And now Metasploit is waiting for connections, as you can see, on port 8080 and on my IP address, which is 10.20.14.213. So now if anybody opens the backdoor that we created in the previous lecture, because it's a reverse backdoor, the backdoor will try to connect to the IP that we set when we created the backdoor, which was 10.20.14.213, and it'll try to connect on port 8080. It's gonna come to this computer, and this computer is already waiting for that connection from this multi-handler module. So the connection will be established, and then I'll be able to control the target computer, and I'll basically hack it and have full control over it. Now in the next lecture, I'll show you a very basic way to deliver the backdoor to the target computer and how to test the backdoor and make sure that it works properly. Now we're ready to receive connections from our backdoor. So we created the backdoor, we set a payload and we're listening for incoming connections here from any connection that comes in from the same backdoor on the same port on the same IP. So now if a person runs that backdoor, will receive the connection back in here on this computer. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna test the backdoor to make sure that it works. And to do that, we're gonna use a very basic delivery method. Later on in the course, we're gonna talk about smart delivery methods that will trick the person into opening the file that we're sending to them. For now, we're just doing a very basic example just to test our very basic backdoor. So to do that, we're just gonna put the backdoor on our web server and then download it from the target computer. So there is nothing smart about this and you probably can't use this way to deliver the backdoor to a real person. So we're only doing this for testing to make sure our backdoor works. So Kali comes in with a web server and what that means basically you can use Kali as a website. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put that backdoor in that website and then just download it from the target Windows machine. Now the website directory where you should store the website files is var www.html. So I'll show you where it is now. If we, if you just click in here on the path and then put a forward slash, it'll allow you to type, to manually type the path that you want to go to. So we wanna go to var www.html. And this is the location 
where the website files are stored. Now for you, you'll probably only have index.html, you won't have all of that stuff, but that's just stuff that I created while I was testing a few things. So the index is the main page that people usually see when they browse to this website. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to first of all create a directory and I'm going to call it evil files. So every time we create a backdoor or a keylogger, we're going to put it in here and then download it in the Windows machine to test it. And again, later on in the delivery method section, we're going to talk about smart delivery methods. For now, we're only going to be creating the evil files and test them to make sure that they work as expected. So I'm going to call this directory evil files. And inside it, I'm going to put the backdoor that we created before. So the backdoor that we created was made using Villivision. And Villivision actually gave us the full path of it when we created it, if you remember. Or you can go back now to the lecture and have a look on it. So I'm just going to press Control T to open a new tab. And then again, I'm going to click on the, men on the path in here. And I'm going to put forward slash to manually enter the path. And then we're going to go to var, lib, villivasion, output, compiled, hit enter. And you'll see the backdoor that I created right here. And we named it rev https 8080. So I'm going to copy this and paste it in here. And that's it. Now we can download this file from the website that Kali uses, that Kali has. Now to start the web server, to start the website, we have to start its service from the command prompt. And to do that, we're going to do service, Apache 2, start. So the command is service to start the service. Apache 2 is the name of the web server. And then we want to start this web server. I'm going to hit enter. And because we didn't get any errors, that means the command got executed properly. Now everything is done. So the IP of the Kali machine was 1020.14.213. It's the same IP that we're listening here. And it's the same IP that you'd get if you run ifconfig. So I'm going to go to, um, to my Windows machine. And I'm going to navigate to my IP address of the Kali machine, which is 10.20.14.213. And this will open the basic index.html that I showed you. And it basically just says it works, telling us that the web server is working and the website is working. This is all inside var www.html. So if I wanted to go to the directory where we put the backdoor, then we're just going to go to evil files because we called it evil files. I'm going to hit enter. And you can see the backdoor that we created in the previous lecture and we called it rev https 8080. So if I click on that, it's going to download it for me. And like I said before, this, this is not the smartest way to deliver the backdoor. But right now, all we want to do is just to test the backdoor and make sure that it works. So if I click on the downloads and run the backdoor, it's going to tell me that this is an executable. So be careful when you run it. But this is not detecting a, a virus. It's literally just saying be careful when you run EXEs. I'm going to run it anyway. And once we come back here, you'll see that we received a connection from the target machine. So we didn't connect to the target computer. The target computer connected back to us. So you can see the IP of the target computer, which is 10.20.14.206. And that IP connected back to us on port 8080. Right here. So basically now we have full control over that computer. Right here you can see that we have a meterpreter session. And what Meterpreter allows us to do is literally do anything that the user can do on their computer. So we'll see how we can use the Meterpreter later on in the post connection attacks. For now, we can see that the backdoor is working. And if we do sysinfo, you can see that we are inside the MS Edge Windows 10 machine. 
it's a uh, windows 10 right here it's x64 it uses english us and it uses a interpreter x86 for windows so as i said now we can do anything we want on the target machine and we'll talk about how to use the interpreter later on in the post connection section but again basically right now we hacked the target computer and we have full control over it okay so let's see how we can gain full control and get a interpreter session from the target computer so again we're going to go on the commands and we're going to go on the social engineering now there's actually a number of ways that you can use in here to get a reverse shell now it all depends on how you want to make your social engineering attack what we're going to use we're going to use a notification bar a fake notification bar and we're choosing firefox because our target is runs on firefox or are using firefox so what this will do it will basically tell the user it will display a notification bar telling the user that there is a new update or there's a plugin that you need to install once they install the plugin then they'll actually install a backdoor and you'll gain full access to their computer so the way we're going to do this is we're going to use the same backdoor that we always created and we've been using now i actually have it stored in my a web server so i have it stored in var www.html and i have it called update.exe but it's the same backdoor the same reverse http interpreter that we used before so i'm gonna give the full address to it here so it's stored in 10 20 14 207 that's my actual ip and the name of the file is update.exe and then the notification um, the notification is just saying there is an additional plugin that needs to be installed to display some elements on this page now you can change this and just say um, critical update for firefox click here to install So I'm going to hit execute and if we go on the target you can see that they're getting a message telling them that there is a new update for Firefox and click here to download and install. So the target person will be like oh yeah I need to install this. So they download it and now basically they have a backdoor downloaded on their machine. Once they try to run this backdoor to install the update they think it's an update but they'll actually run a backdoor which will give us full access to their computer. Before I run the backdoor, I need to listen on the port exactly like we did it before. So I'm just going to do show options here to show you. I'm not going to go through all the steps. It's using Metasploit multi-handler. Same way we did it in the video of listening for ports. So we're using Meterpeter reverse HTTP. I have my IP and the port. So I'm just going to do exploit. And I'm listening for the connections now. Now let's run the update that we just downloaded. And if we go on the target, you can see that we got full control over it using a interpreter session. Now, again, this is just an example of one way of gaining full control over the target computer. There's a number of ways that you can do using beef and there's a number of social engineering attacks that you can do to gain full access on the target computer. So again, I highly recommend you go over the plugins and experiment with them and see what attacks you can come up with. Now let's talk about how we can prevent XSS vulnerabilities. The way these vulnerabilities happen is because whatever a user enters something into a text box or into a parameter, that input is displayed into the HTML. So it's treated as if it's part of the page and therefore if there is JavaScript in it, the code is being executed. So to prevent this ex exploit, the best thing to do is to try and minimize the, the usage of untrusted input. So anytime a user inputs something or anytime something's input from parameters, try to minimize that. Also, make sure that you always escape whatever that's going to be 
displayed or used into the HTML page. Because XSS can not only be injected into places where things are displayed on the page, but it can also be injected into parameters of certain elements of the HTML page. So what I mean by scaping is converting each of these characters to what they would be represented by in HTML. You can do that using scripts and you can do that using your own script. Now let me show you how this happens. Now I'm here at my vulnerable web page that we were using and I'm going to go to the stored one. And obviously you can see that every time we click on that the XSS runs. So let's inspect this element. Now this element is where we injected our alert. And if we right click and go on inspect element, it will show us the HTML of this page or the HTML of this particular element right here highlighted. So I'm going to make this bigger. And if we look at it right here, you'll see that we have the name and that's Zaid. And then the other input, which is the message, it's a script and the script, what the script does, it does alert XSS. So it's exactly what we injected into it when we did the comment. So every time we run this page, this piece of code gets, is executed. So what we need to do is we need to make sure every time a user enters something and that something will be displayed on a page or that something will be used somewhere in the element. So even the ID here or even the H, the ID is just, for example, is a parameter of the div. It's not displayed. You never see this ID, but this is, this can be injectable, can be injected as well. So hackers can actually try to inject stuff into the parameters. They can try to inject stuff into the image attributes, for example. They can do an image and inject stuff into the source or into the URL. So this is just an example here. And every time a user's input is going to be used anywhere on the page. So even if you don't see it, if you usually don't see it, you need to make sure that you escape that input and make sure that it does not contain any code. And if it contains any code, then it's, it's converted to its HTTP equivalent. Once you escape this, you'll actually see this in the message. So you see the message as script alert XSS, but it will never be executed. The, the, this script will never actually be executed on the target person when they run it. And this is exactly what the high security level implements. So let me go to the security settings. And let me close this. And I'm going to set this to high. I'm going to submit it. And we'll go back to our reflected. It's the same measurement are taken in the reflected and in the stored. And now if we try to inject any of our codes that we were doing before, for example, if we try to inject this script, so script alert XSS, and then we close the script, you'll see the script exactly the same way that you would have seen a normal name. So if we say Zaid here, you'll just see my name. And if we inject our script, you'll see it appearing as if it's a normal name. It doesn't appear. You don't only see what's between the tags and then the code doesn't even get executed. If we look at the source, you'll see that you see all the tags. So you can see the script tag, you can see the close of the script tag and everything has been injected properly. So you think that this should work, but it doesn't work because the website or the web page or the browser knows that these tags are should be treated as HTML characters and should not be treated as part of the code. And this is all thanks to a function that's being used here, which is called the HTML special characters. So it's all thanks to this function. So whatever you're inputting in the name, it's being filtered through this function. Now this function will iterate over each character that you entered and it'll tell HTML or the browser, it'll change it to its equivalent in HTML code. Therefore, the browser will know that this is not part of the code and this is part of what should be displayed on screen as text. And this way, no matter what you try to inject, it will be converted to HTML code, which will just be displayed on screen like normal text or normal characters. Now, as a user, to prevent yourself from being used into an XSS attack, 
Now, the URL coming to you will probably look like a URL of a trusted website. For example, let's assume that you work in a company and there was an XSS in your company and you were logging into your company and the code gets executed on you, then there isn't much you can do yourself. But you need to be careful. So with Beef, we saw in order to exploit the vulnerabilities, we were showing, for example, a fake update. So make sure when you, if you get an, if you get a message always that there is an update, make sure you actually go to the website that provides the, that application. So if Firefox said that there is an update, go to the fa to the website of face of Firefox and see if there is actually an update. And if there is, download it from that website. Don't download it from the notification that you got. Also, make sure you're downloading it from a HTTPS website. And once you download it, you can inspect it and check it the same way that we've seen before to make sure that there is no backdoors or anything in it. You can also check the MD5 sum to make sure that the file hasn't been manipulated while it was being downloaded. The same when we did the fake Facebook login when you were with beef. So what you can do is whenever you're told that you got logged out and please log back in again, ignore that, go to facebook.com, make sure it's going through HTTPS and then log into Facebook. So always try to be careful with notifications popping up, telling you, you need to do stuff. Always be wary and never trust them. In this lecture, we're gonna learn how to bypass authentication by manipulating cookie values. Now this doesn't always happen and it's not always possible, but it's possible when the session management is programmed in a way that can easily be by bypassed. And I'll talk more about that once we actually do the attack. But before we do anything, we need to have a plugin that allow us to modify our cookies. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is go on Google and look for cookie editor, Firefox. And I'm gonna download cookie manager plus. All you have to do is just click on the link, add to Firefox and install. And it's gonna ask you to restart. So I'm gonna restart it. And it should be installed now. Now, the cookies are used to authenticate users after they log in. So for example, once you go in here and log in, I've already created an account on this. You can create one by just clicking on the register here. And the account that I created, the username is Zaid, and the password is 123456. Now, once I log in here, you'll notice that every time I go to a different page, I don't have to log in again. So every time I just browse through this website, you'll see that I don't get presented to log in again. And everywhere I go, it knows that I'm logged in as Zaid. Now, this is possible based on cookies. So every time I go to this website or to these pages, they know that Zaid is trying to get in here because the cookies are stored in my browser. And every time I request something from this website, the cookies are sent to that web page and it's telling it that Zaid has already authenticated himself and he is just trying to display this website. So even if I close this, uh, so I'm just gonna close Day and just get back to it again. you'll see that I'm still logged in as Zaid. Now cookies have a date of expiry and they'll expire after a while. Sometimes the cookies are configured in a way that they can be easily manipulated. So let's have a look on the cookies for this website. Now, if we go, I'm gonna click on Alt to display the menus here. And then I'm gonna go on Tools, Cookie Manager Plus. And I'm going to search for the name of this website, which is 10, 20, 14, 2, 12. And that will display all the cookies that have been sent. So you can see that the PHP SSID and all these cookies. You can see that there's an, two interesting cookies. One of them is called username. And the other one is called user ID or UID. So this is really interesting. And if we click on edit, you'll see that we have the name of the cookie is UID or user ID and the content is 17. So you can try to guess that means that this cookie is telling this page 
that the user ID of the person who's trying to visit this page is 17. So we can guess that the user ID for Zaid for the user that I just created is 17. So what we can do is we can try to modify this to a different value and see what happens. And often admin users are created first at, e at every website. So we can try to go for one. So I'm just gonna delete the seven and I'm gonna keep it as one. And then we're gonna save the cookies like this. I'm gonna close that. And then I'm just gonna refresh the page. And now you can see that I've actually, I'm logged in as admin and I can browse the website and do anything that the admins allowed to do. And we managed to do this very simply by modifying our cookies and changing our user ID to user ID number one. So this was possible because the cookies that are used are very simple. Now cookies should be more complicated. So they, they should actually use what's known as session IDs or tokens. These tokens should be very complicated and not relate to the user ID. That way, I wouldn't be able to know what the user ID, even if I know that the admin has a user ID of one, I wouldn't be able to know what token that admin is using. So they should be dynamically generated based on each user and they should vary from time to time. So even for the same user, every time he logs in, they should get different token randomly based on some parameters so that it's very difficult for anybody to know what token each user gets. Otherwise, it'll be very easily for people to guess what token the admin or any other user has and just inject it into their browser. Now using complicated tokens and session IDs is still vul vulnerable for man in the middle attacks. And we've seen that in plugins like Fire Sheep and in programs like Ferret and Hamster, where I actually explained that in my network penetration testing course, where you could gain access to any user account as long as the people are on the same network as you. So even if the token is really complicated, you'll be able to capture that token and then inject it into the browser. But the main idea is the website is not vulnerable because you can't guess it yourself. You, ha you have to actually capture that token from another person and then inject it. Whereas in here, we were able to just know or guess that the admin has an ID of one, inject it, and then log in as admin. In this lecture, we're gonna have a look on CSRF or cross-site request forgery. These vulnerabilities allow us to force a user to do things that they don't want to do. For example, once you log into a website, let's take Facebook, You'll be able to do certain things to your profile. So you can upload pictures, you can change your password, you can change your information, send messages, and post stuff to your wall. Now CSRF occurs when the website doesn't validate if the user actually wants to do the certain task. So it doesn't check if the user actually intends to change their profile picture or to change their password. So if the website doesn't do that, we'll be able to program a HTML page and if the user clicks it or runs it, they'll be forced to carry out a certain task that we program it to do. For example, we can get the user to, to change their password without them even knowing. Let's have an example on how this happens and it'll become more clear to you. So I have my DBWA here and I'm just gonna log in with my username and password, which is admin. And I'm gonna put my password. Now, if we go to the CRSF tab here, you'll see that it allows us to change our, our password. So this is just like a normal control panel to a normal website. And usually when you log into your account, one of the features that you can do is you can change your password to a different password. So from here, I'm gonna set my password to 222222. And I'll set it in here as well, the same password. I'm gonna hit enter. And as you can see, it's telling us that the password has been changed. So this is an example of a feature that the user can do to their account, they can change their password. If the target website, which is DVWA, doesn't check if the user actually wants to do this task, then we can create a page that is similar to this page. And once the user runs that page, they'll actually change their password without them even knowing. 
Now there's a number of ways to analyze the connection and analyze the information sent between the client and the target to make that CSRF exploit. I'm gonna show you the easiest and most reliable way and it works regardless of the type of form, whether it's post or get. So with this particular one, it's actually really easy to exploit if you just send the URL right here to the target user. And then if they run it, their password will be changed. But in more complicated ways, sometimes you don't see that, sometimes post is used. So I'll show you the most reliable way to do this kind of attack. So the first thing to do is right click the form that you want to hijack. You were gonna inspect the element. And we're gonna look to at where the form is. So we're gonna look at where is the start of the form tag and the end of the form tag. I'm actually gonna right click it in here inside the form. And as you can see now we have the start of the form is in here and it ends with, with a slash form, forward slash form, and you can see it right here at the end. So this is the part of the code that we're interested into. This is the, the part of the code that we want to modify and send to the target user so that when they run it, they'll actually change their password without them knowing. So I'm gonna right click this and I'm gonna edit as HTML and I'm gonna copy everything inside here. So I'm gonna do control A, control C and that's copied for me. And then I'm gonna go to my leaf pad right here and I'm gonna paste it. And I'm gonna save this and we'll call it csrf.html. And I'll put this in the desktop and click on save. And that's it saved. Now if we, let's just run this code at the start and see what we get. So I have it right here on my desktop and I'm just gonna double click it. And as you can see, you just get a page, a normal page that asks you for a new password and a conf to confirm the password. So you can see the form here is actually similar to the form that we want to hijack. Now to get that page to work, we need to modify a few things. Now you can see here we have a form right here and the action is set to a hashtag. So it actually doesn't give a website to submit this form to. So the first thing you want to modify is you want to give it to the website to submit this form to. And this is going to be the same website that we're on at the moment. So I'm going to control copy this. And I'm going to put it in here instead of the hashtag. Now sometimes you'll actually, if you're copying a form from a different website, you might actually see a name of a file. So you'll just see a file name. You wanna make sure you have the full URL to the, to the form because if you just have a file name, for example, if you just have index.php, it won't know where that index.php is. It know it when it's on the website because it's already stored on that website. But when we're actually taking the file like this and storing it on our local machine, you wanna make sure you have the full URL URL in here. So even if you've seen something instead of the hashtag, if you've seen something like index.php or whatever, keep that in there, but make sure you give it the full URL that comes before that page. So this is all good. Now, if I save this and if we run this, we'll actually be able to change the password using this form. Now, the beautiful thing about these exploits, you can actually confirm that it works for you first and then you can send it to the target client or to the target person. So if we actually reset our password here, so I'm gonna set the password to 333, 333, and confirm it in here. And then I'm gonna do hit enter you'll see that we get a message telling us that the password has been changed and we can actually now log out and log in with the new password. So this is good. Now we have a form that's actually not stored on the website, but using it, we can actually go to that website and change the password. So this actually confirms that the target website is vulnerable to CSRF because it's not validating that the request is coming from the website itself. So it's not validating if the user actually wants to do that. Now the web page that we made so far is not very good because it still asks the user to change their username and password and the user still picks what username and password they want to use. So now we're going to modify our code one more time 
And with this time, we're actually going to make everything invisible and we're gonna make this code to be submitted automatically once the user browses the page. So the first thing to make everything hidden, we're going to convert all the inputs and we're gonna add to them type equals hidden. So you can see we have an input here and I'm gonna add an argument saying type equals hidden. I'm also gonna add it to this input right here which is the input that confirms the password. So we're gonna set that to hidden as well. And we're gonna change the last input which submits the code, as you can see here it's called change. We're gonna change that to hidden as well so the user won't see this input either. This is the submit button. And I'm gonna remove everything written on the page. So you can see that in here it says confirm password. So I'm gonna remove that. And we can see that in here it also asks for the new password. So I'm gonna remove this part as well. And I'm gonna remove this tag. And now I have my three inputs and I have my form. So I only have the important parts of the code. So we have our first input and it's set to hidden. This is the first input that the user puts the password in. Um, we have the second input right here, which is the confirm password. And then we have the submit button. Now we're gonna remove the types from here, from the input, from the password inputs. And instead of that, we're gonna add a value. So we're actually gonna set the value for the new password. And this time we're gonna set it to six sixes. So one, two, three, one, two, three. And I'm gonna do the same with the confirm, with the confirm password input. So we're gonna set its value to 666, 666, because we've already changed the type to hidden. And I misspelled type in here. So I'm gonna save this and I'll just open this in my browser just to see what this website looks like now. Now, as you can see, the page is actually empty, but if we view the source, you'll see that we still have our forms. So you can see, I'm just gonna zoom on this. You can see that still submitting the form to the right place. It has the input, which is set to hidden, and then it has the new password, the value is set to six sixes. We also have the confirm password. It's also set to hidden and the value is six sixes. And we have our input, the one that changes everything. And this one is set to hidden as well. So all of this good. Now the last thing we wanna do is we want this to be executed automatically when the user double clicks the file. So we don't want the user to hit anything. We even made our input, the submit button, we made it hidden. So we want the user, as soon as they run this file, they get redirected to the page that will change their password. To do that, we're gonna need to use a JavaScript code that'll automatically submit this form. So once the page loads, it'll automatically submit this form. So the first thing we need to do, we're gonna need to set an ID for this form so that JavaScript can identify this form. So I'm gonna give it an ID and I'm gonna set that to, let's say form one. And I'm gonna place the JavaScript code in here. And to do that, we're gonna need to put it between two JavaScript tags. So we're gonna start with the script and we need to close that tag as well. So it's a slash script. Then we're gonna do document to access the current document. Dot get element by ID. So we can access the form that we just created and we called it form one. Then we're gonna place the ID that we just created and we called it form one right here. So we're gonna change that to here. So we're gonna say form one. So the code so far will access the current document and it's gonna look for an element that has the ID of number one. Then we're gonna tell it what we want to do with that element, with that form, and we're gonna want it to submit. So we're gonna say dot submit. So the code is very simple. We just added an ID to the current form. We called it form one. And then we added a JavaScript code, starting with a script and ending with a forward slash script. And we said the document, and we want you to get the element by ID. We want you to get form one, and we want you to submit it. 
Now, once the user double clicks this file, the file will be executed automatically without the user having to do anything. So let's see this in action. I'm gonna come now, I'm gonna close this. And I'm gonna close this one as well. And I'm just gonna double click my new file right here. And as you can see, automatically, I got a new page and this page is telling me that the password have been changed. So the user didn't click anything, the user didn't put any password and the page was executed from a place that's not on the same web server. So it was executed from the local machine, but still it submitted the information, the website accepted the information and the website changed my password to the new password. So my password now, the admin password have been changed to 666666. So if I log out, and try to log in. I'm going to put my username as admin and the password to 666666. Hit enter. And you'll see that I logged in with the new password instead of my original password. Now it's all up to you and how smart you, you are with, how, with tricking the targets, with how to get them to run your file. So now it's all down to social engineering, how you're going to send it, what you're going to pretend that the file is going to be. One way is to send the file as it is, as HTML. The other way is just to host the file on a HTML web hosting. So you can upload it to any web hosting. There's a lot of free ones. And then you can just send the URL of the file instead of even getting the target person to download the file, which will be much less suspicious. In the previous lecture, we seen how to create a HTML web page that exploits SESRF vulnerability that will automatically submit a form. And we've seen how we can exploit it to get the target person to change their password without them even knowing. So as soon as they double click the file, this form will be automatically submitted, changing the password to the password that we want. One problem with that is it's usually a bit difficult to get people to run files, even though it's just a HTML file and you can use smart social engineering skills to get them to run it. It's still a bit difficult and it'll be much easier if we can just send them a link which will change their password as soon as they click on that link. And this is actually really easy because the file we created is a HTML file. So all we have to do is just upload that file to a web hosting company. Now there is a lot of free web hosting online. You can just upload that file there. You can use a URL shortening service as well to make the URL shorter and less suspicious. And then you can send it to the target person. So I'm gonna show you how to do that, but I'm actually gonna do it on my local machine because everything for me here is local, but it works on the external websites exactly the same. You, you'll just have to upload the, the HTML page on a web hosting. Doesn't matter if it's free or, free or paid, but there is a lot of free ones. So I'm gonna use my local Apache server right here. And then we're gonna browse it from our target Windows machine and we'll see how that is gonna be executed and how the password is gonna be changed. So before I do anything, I'm actually just going to reopen the file and I'm going to set the password to 777777 instead of 666. So we just know that the password has been changed to the new one. And I'll change it in here as well. And now I'm going to copy this to my local web server in Kali. First of all, I'm going to copy the file to my document root. So the file is stored in the desktop now. So I'm going to do cp desktop csrf to var www.html and now I'm going to start my Apache so I'm going to do service Apache to start. Now everything's working so I'm just going to get my IP address and my IP address is 10.20.14.2.13 so I'm just going to go to a Windows machine now in this machine, I'm actually pretending to be a target user. So first of all, I have to be logged in to my account. So I'm just going to go to DVWA. So I'm going to log in with my username, which is admin. And I'm going to log in with my old password, which is, or to my current password, the one that we resetted previously, which is six sixes. Now, as you can see, I can log in normally. Now I'm going to go, I'm going to close this. Now we're going to browse to the page that contains the forged CSRF exploit. So we're going to pretend that 
I was social engineered and someone gave me a URL to click. So at the moment, we're actually not gonna download any file. We're not gonna double click any file. All we're gonna do is literally just browse a URL. And once we do that, our password is gonna be changed. So the page, as I said, you can host it on free hosting. There's a lot of free hosting online. At the moment, I have it hosted on my Kali machine and its IP is 10.20.14.213. And then I'm going to put my, the name of the page, which was set to csrf.html. I'm going to hit enter. And as you can see, it's telling me that the password has been changed. And all I did, again, all I did is just run a URL. So it's all down to you to how you're going to convince your target to execute that URL. So if I just log out now and log in again, You'll see that my password now, I have to log in with admin. And I'm actually going to type the password here. So it's 777777. And I'm going to copy all of this and paste it down there. Just so that you actually know that the password has been changed to 7777. So the vulnerable URL was 10.20.14.213 forward slash CSRF. Anybody who would run this URL and logged into the target website, they'll be forced to change their password to 777777. Now you can use this method, as I said, with any website that is vulnerable to a CSRF and it'll force the user to do any action you want. All you have to do is just adapt the same method to the form. So whether it's a payment form, whether it's a sign up form, whether it's a submit article form, whether it's a form that sends a message to a friend, you can just change the website, right click, inspect the form element, copy the form code, hide everything, add the JavaScript code that submits the website, that submits the form automatically. Then you can send the web, the HTML website as it is to the target person, or you can upload it to an on online hosting and then just send the hosting URL to the target person. Once they browse that URL, the web page will be automatically executed, forcing them to change their password or to do the action that you want them to do. Now that we know how to discover and exploit CSRF vulnerabilities, let's talk about how to protect websites from them. So if we just go back now to DVWA and set the security to high, you'll see that they have a very simple way to protect against it, but this way actually works. And what they do is they ask you for the current password. So even if we get this form and we do all the forging and all the stuff that we were doing and then send it to the target person. We can't actually hide this and get it to automatically submit because we don't know the current password. So it asks for the current password and then it allows you to add a new password. So this is a really good solution for this case only though, because what if the form actually doesn't change a password? What if we're just going to send messages pretending to be that person? What if we're going to post things to that person's wall? What if we're going to post things into that person's blog? So CSRF can be exploited to do many things, as I said in previous videos, and this method will only protect against changing the password. You can't really ask the person for their password every time that they want to post something or to do something with their profile. Now, newer versions of DVWA that don't come with Metasploitable 2 actually have a more secure option that will implement the method that I'm going to talk to you about it now. It's actually called impossible instead of high, but it doesn't matter. It's not exploitable anyway, so we don't really need to have it installed. So let's talk about how you could actually prevent these vulnerabilities from happening without asking the user to re-enter information or to re-enter their password. If you think of it, the way we were able to exploit this is we were able to just copy the form that the website uses and send it to the target person and get that person to run it or automatically run on the target person's computer. So once the request is sent to the server, the server wasn't doing any type of validation to ensure that the user actually wants to change their password. So the best way to prevent CSRF is to make sure that the user is submitting data through a page that was served to him by the web application and not by anyone else. A good way of implementing that is to use synchronizing tokens. 
Now I know the name sounds complicated, but the idea is very simple. Basically, we want to generate a unique and random token at the server side. Then when the page is loaded, when the form is loaded, we're going to embed this already generated token into that page as a hidden form. Then when the form is submitted, we're going to make sure that the form was submitted with that token that we sent to that specific user. So basically we give the user a token and then we wait for him to submit the form with the token that we gave him. That way the token that the hacker gets will only work for him. So even if he generates a page and send it to the target and the target runs the page, the form will be submitted but it will be refused by the server because it did not give that token to that user, it gave that token to the hacker. Say for example we have this user here and he requests facebook.com password.php. It goes to the server, the server is gonna generate a response for that request so it's going to return the HTML page that represents password.php. In that page, it's going to include a unique token. So when the page is loaded at the client side, it's gonna already have the form that the user is looking for plus a unique token that was generated by the server. Then when the user submits whatever they want to submit, the server will only accept the form and will, or will only respond to what the user is asking if the user returns the same token. Now if this isn't implemented properly, it can still be exploited. So if the token was predictable or if the same token was being used, then the, the hacker can discover what the token is, embed it in the HTML code and send it to the user. So the token needs to have certain characteristics so that it's secure. And basically the main things that you want to keep in mind is that the token needs to be unpredictable and it cannot be reused. Regardless of the way you're going to implement this, these are the two main things that you want to keep in mind. Because if it was predictable, then the hacker will be able to create their own tokens and then embed them in the code and run the attack. Same if the token can be reused, then the hacker can just use their token or someone else's token to target their target. So in order to make the token unpredictable and make it so that it can't be used, then the token needs to be a large value so that the hacker can't do a brute force attack and discover what the token is. The token needs to be random so that the hacker will not be able to create their own tokens. And it needs to be unique for each user because if users get the same token or similar tokens, then they can pass them around and then the token that works for the hacker will work for other people. So that will defy the whole point. You can also increase the security of the token by including other factors in the token generation algorithm. So you can include, for example, the date and time, then combine it with a secure random generator and then encrypt that. All of this is obviously happening at the server side, so the hacker will not be able to know what algorithm you're using because the code will be executed at the server side. You don't necessarily have to do this, using a secure, large and unique random number is enough, but if you want to increase the security, then you can just add other factors and encrypt the token before you send it to the user. This is actually implemented in Matilde, so let me just show it to you in action. So I'm just going to go to Matilde in here. And I'm going to go on OWASP10 CSRF and add to blog. So this allows you to add a blog post. So it doesn't allow you to change your password or anything. It actually allows anonymous people to add posts as well. So you can't really ask people for a password. I'm actually going to go and toggle security so that it's the highest because it's at zero right now. So now it's the most secure and if we right click this and go on inspect element now I'm going to scroll up and as you can see we have the form here and we have a hidden input with a very long value and this is the token. So this has already been generated by the server and the server will refuse any request that we send to it unless it has this specific token.
And if I use this form and send it to someone else, then again, the requests that they will send will be refused because they'll get a different token. This token was generated for me and for me only. So let me show you, if I actually refresh right now, I'm gonna get a different token. And again, if I refresh again, I'll get a different token. And if I modify this, so let's say instead of the capital I at the end, I'm gonna put a small I. And if I submit this now, it's given me an error. But let me not change this. So again, I got a different token now. And if I just submit it the way it is, it's going to work. And now we have a blog entry called test. So that's it. It's actually very, very simple. I didn't want to go into too much details about how to create a random token and all that because that's going to be specific dependent on the programming language that the web application is programmed in. But I was, I just wanted to show you the concept or the idea of how to secure web, web applications against this type of vulnerability. The whole idea is you wanna make sure that the user submits their data through a page that you served to them and not by a page that was given to them by any other person. So in order to do that, we generate a token at the server side. This token needs to be long, random, and unique send that token with the page, with the form, and embed it as a hidden form. And then whenever a user submits the response, make sure that they submit the same token that was given to them. Now let's assume you tried all the attacks that we learned so far on your target website. You tried all of them on all the websites on the same server, and none of these websites is vulnerable. You went and you tried to hack into that server using the applications installed on the server using the server side attacks. So you used the port scanner and you, you determined the programs and the open ports and you tried to hack into the server based on these services. And again, you still didn't find any way to get in. And let's assume that you try to attack the data center itself, which contains all the servers. And again, you still didn't manage to gain access. And you try to hack the users that use the websites, all the websites on the same server as your target website. So you try to hack the users, you try to hack the admins, uh, you try to hack the support people using social engineering attacks and all these attacks. And again, you still didn't manage to gain your access. Then... I'd usually go down to brute force attacks. Now, a lot of people would actually try brute force attacks before that, but I just don't really like brute force attacks. Not because they're not useful or because they're not effective. They're actually very effective, but it's just that I don't really feel satisfaction when I gain access to a system using a brute force attack. So what we, what we mean by brute force attacks is we're going to go to the login screen. Most websites have login screen to allow the admins to log in. And we're going to try to determine all possible combinations of the password. So there's two flavors of brute force attacks, or I should say guessing attacks. There is brute force attacks and dictionary attacks. So brute force attacks would try to cover all possible combinations of the password. For example, on your phone, the pin can only be made out of numbers. So you can actually cover all possibilities very easily because the pin only has four digits and there is only nine possibilities. When this comes to passwords, especially when it comes to web logins, you have lowercase characters, uppercase characters, symbols, and digits, which makes the brute force attack really unfeasible because it'll take years to cover all possibilities. This leads us to the dictionary attack where you actually cover all possibilities in a list. So you're gonna have a list of passwords. These can be made of common passwords or based on the research that you did on your target. In the dictionary attack, you'll only cover the passwords that exist in the word list. So unlike the brute force attack, it's not guaranteed because with the brute force, we're gonna cover all possible combinations. In the dictionary attack, we're only gonna cover the passwords that are in our word list or in the dictionary. So in the next few lectures, we're gonna see how you can create your own dictionary. And we're gonna see how we can launch a brute force attack to gain access to a system without exploiting any vulnerabilities. All we're gonna do is just try 
a large number of passwords until one of them works. And this is the reason why I don't really like brute force because there is no smart way you're not actually exploiting anything. You're literally just guessing the password until it works. Keep in mind though, just because I don't really like it, it doesn't mean that it's not effective. I've actually, in many cases, I spent days trying to break into a system and at the end, one of the times I still remember, the password was 123456ABC, which you'll probably, if you had a word list of common passwords, you'll probably gain access to that system within an hour or two. In this lecture, we're going to learn how to create a word list. This is a really handy skill to have under your belt if you want to be a penetration tester. Because you're going to face a lot of scenarios where a word list attack can become very handy. So you can actually go ahead and look for ready word lists on the internet and there is some really really good ones. And you should, you should probably use a lot of them because some of them just have the common passwords. But in many cases, you might actually need to create your own word list. So in this lecture, we're going to learn how you create your own word list using a tool called Crunch. So using the tool is very simple. All you have to do is just put the name of the tool and then you specify the minimum number of characters for the passwords to be generated. Then we're going to specify the maximum number of characters for the password. Then you specify the characters that you want to generate passwords from. For example, you can put all lowercase characters, all uppercase, you can put numbers, digits, or you can just specify a small, a smaller number to make the word list smaller. You can also use the option T, which is an optional, to give a pattern. So for example, let's say that you were looking at the person while they were typing their password, and you've seen that the password will start with an A. So you can tell Crunch that the password will start with an A and then give me all possible combination of passwords that start with an A. And after that, we use the minus O option to specify the file name where the passwords are, are going to be stored. So we have a small little example here that will generate uh, a list of passwords that contain that start from six characters to eight characters and contain these characters right here. So it's going to create combinations of one, two, three, A, B, C, and the dollar sign. And it's going to store it in a file called, that should be an O, I'll fix that, in a file called word list. And these passwords are going to start with an A and end with a B, and it will generate passwords based on all possible combinations between the A and the B. So all of the generated passwords will always start with A and end with B. So let's have an example of the tool. Now the tool actually have a lot of options other than what we've seen so far. So if you just type in man crunch, you'll see all the options that you can set and you'll see detailed description about all of these options. So it's actually really, really good. You can go ahead and spend some time to get familiar with the tool. Now I'm going to show you the example and based on the example, you'll be able to run all of these commands. But if you want to run or create some advanced word lists, then I highly recommend that you go over this. One of the really cool options that I want to highlight is the minus P option. The minus P option tells Crunch to generate passwords that don't have repeating characters. For example, when you specify all lowercase characters, you specify A, B, C, D, it will start by generating passwords made of A, 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 and then A, A, B, then A, B, 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 and all of that. So when you do this, Crunch will actually ignore these type of passwords and it will only create passwords that don't have any repeating characters. And that will reduce the size of the word list from the number of characters to the power of the length to the number of characters factorial. If you scroll down, you'll actually see more examples of commands and the type of word lists that will be created. So again, you can have a look on these and get yourself fami familiar with. Once you're done looking at the man, you can just press Q and you'll be out of it. And we're going to run our command here. So we're going to use crunch. And again, I want to generate passwords of minimum of six characters and maximum of eight characters. And I want them to contain combinations of A, B, C. And let's say the digits one, two. Now in here, you can actually keep listing things. You can list characters, you can list uppercase characters or even symbols if you wanted to. 
Once you're done with listing the characters, we're gonna specify the file to save it to, and we're gonna save it in a file called test.txt. So the command is very simple. It's crunch, minimum length of the password, the maximum length of the password, followed by the characters that we want to use to generate passwords from, and then O to the file that the passwords are gonna be stored in. I'm gonna hit enter. And as you can see now, it's telling us that it generated 448,000 passwords, approximately, and they're all stored in a file called test.txt now. The size of the file is 4 megabytes, and now I can open this file by doing cat test.txt, and as you can see now, we can see all the passwords that have been generated. I'm going to control C out of it because it's a huge file. And as you can see, it actually contains all possible combinations of A, B, C, 1, 2. I also want to show you an example of using the minus T option. So I'm going to set this to only 6 to 6, so it's only 6 characters. And we're going to use the minus T option, which is the pattern option. And I'm going to tell it that I want the password to always start with an A. And then I want you to fill all possible combinations of characters between the A and the B. So I want passwords that start with an A and end with a B. And in the middle, at the add sign, you can fill all possible combinations of A, B, C, 1, 2. Gonna hit enter. As you can see now, the number of passwords is much less. It's only 625 passwords because I've narrowed down the possibilities of passwords. Again, if I do cat test.txt, you'll see that I have all the passwords right here. So this is it. Tool is really useful, can be used in many scenarios. I highly recommend that you spend some time with it and also have, have a look on some of the existing word lists out there on the internet. Now that we have a word list ready, whether you downloaded it from the internet or if you created it by yourself, now we can go ahead and proceed to gaining access to our target website using a word list attack. So we're going to use a tool called Hydra, and Hydra can be used to brute force any type of service really. I can't think of any service that you can't brute force. So it's a really handy tool to know how to use. We're going to do our example on a web login, but you can use it to gain access to SSH, FTP, routers, anything that asks you for a username and a password really. So to use the tool, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to type in Hydra and we're going to put minus help to see how to use it. Now, as you can see, there's a lot of options for the tool, but don't be overwhelmed with that. They're all re pretty simple to use. So if you go up, you can see that the main syntax of using the tool is you. the first thing you have to do is put in the name of the tool. So we're going to put Hydra. And then we're going to put the service that we want to attack. So you can see that they have examples here of you attacking an FTP service, uh, people attacking an IMAP service, and other type of services. So in our example, we are interested into gaining access to our login here to, to this page. And we're going to assume that we don't know a username and a password, and we're going to try to log in to the admin without knowing their password. So our target service is going to be this one. So the first thing you want to use is its IP. So the IP is 10.20.14.2.12. So we're going to put it after the name of the tool. Then looking at the syntax here, you can see that we have to specify a login and a password. So let's have a look on the minus L and the minus P options in here. And you can see that you can use a small L to specify one username or a capital L to specify a list of usernames. So in our example, we're only trying to gain access to the admin. So we're not going to use a list of usernames. We're only going to try to gain access to the admin password. So what we're going to do is we're going to do minus L small 
and then we're going to tell it that the username is admin and then the next thing we need to specify is the password or a password list so similar to the L option you can use a small p to give one password or you can use a capital P to specify a, a file or a word list or a dictionary of passwords so I'm actually going to modify the password file that we created in the previous video I'm just going to open it in my text editor so this one it's right here it's called test.txt and I'm just going to add the password for the admin I know the password for the admin is called admin pass and I'll just add it somewhere in the middle here okay so I'm going to save it and quit it and now our word our word list contains the password so we're going to do minus p capital p and then we're going to give it where the password list is stored and it's stored in root test.txt so everything is good until now and there is only one more thing to do we still haven't specified what type of service that we're attacking so we gave it the IP we gave it the username and we gave it the list of passwords to try but Hydra still doesn't know what type of service that we're going to attack and that is the most important option and the option that you need to pay the most attention to because this is where it gets a bit tricky and this is where things can go wrong so before I start talking about that I'm actually gonna copy our command so far and I'm just gonna paste it in a notepad so all we have to do now is tell Hydra what type of service and how to use this service to brute force the username and password for me and you can see here in the help it's telling us that these are all the type of the supported services so as I said I can't actually think of a service that's not supported so you can have a look on all of these and try them what we're interested into is the HTTP and you can see that there's gonna be a minus and it's gonna be either get or post depending on our target and after that it's also gonna be a form because it's sent through HTML and I'll tell you why it's gonna be like this now let's go down so I'm gonna right click in here and I'm gonna go to inspect element and I'm gonna click I'm gonna look for something called form and you can see that there's a form there has to be a form in the HTML pages and look for the method I'm gonna zoom this in for you and note that in here it says that the method is gonna be post and that way we know that it's a post and if you look at the URL here you'll see that the URL is a HTTP it's not a HTTPS so therefore our module that we're gonna use here or the service is going to be HTTP post form so it's right here you can see it, all the type of services like I said so it's HTTP followed by a minus followed by post and followed by form and to see how we can use this and to see an example of how you can use this service I'm actually gonna control C this and I'm gonna say Hydra minus U and I'm gonna give it the name of the form or the name of the service that I want to use which is going to be HTTP post form as you can see now again it's giving you a long description about how you can use this service and at the bottom it gives you examples and the examples are amazing the examples are really good because you can just copy and paste them and adapt them to your target so the format of this service is you give it the location where the brute force where you want to brute force the form from you're going to give it the user parameter so whether it's a you what's whatever this parameter is called and then you're going to give it the password parameter and then you're going to give it the incorrect message so when there's a failed login what happens to the web page so i'm going to copy this the way it is and we're going to modify it to adapt to our target so the first thing you, we want to put is the page that the login happens from which is this page 
So we're going to put all of this instead of login.php here. So that's all good. Now the next thing that we need to modify is the user and the pass. So these are the names of the parameters that are sent to the web application. And we don't know what these are called. And for this, we're going to use burp suit. Now I'm not going to show you how to configure this because we've done that before. So I'm just going to turn my interceptor on and I'm going to log in with our wrong username and password. So I just want to see what gets sent to the target web application. So I'm just going to log in with a username admin and just any password. So I'm just going to put random characters, hit enter. And I'm going to go on the headers. And this is what's being sent. So you can see that the username parameter is just called username. So I'm going to copy that and put it here instead of user. And we can also see the password parameter. Again, it's called password instead of pass. And you can see that we also have an extra parameter here, which is and login submit button equals login. So you need to add that as well. And in your case, if you had other things that's being sent, you need to add them as well to your request. So we're going to add that after the pass here. Exactly the way it is. We're not going to modify every, anything. So it's just going to be and login PHP submit button equals login. The last thing that we need to modify is this part. And this part is the way that Hydra is going to know whether the login is successful or unsuccessful. So the way this is going to work is you either give it a capital F equals to the unsuccessful, so it equals to the failed attempts, or you can give it a capital S and you tell it what happens when a successful login happens. So in my case, I'm going to give it a capital F to tell it what happens when a failed login happens. And I'm just going to turn off the interceptor now and we can see that we have a failed login. And in a failed login, you can either use this or in my experimentation, it was easier to just use this. So if you just use the message right here that says not logged in. So we're going to say F equals. So this is the most part, the most important part and the most tricky part, I'd say, of the whole attack. So I'm going to go over it again. We can see that the whole request is separated by three columns. The start of it is the location where we want, where the page that we're going to brute force is. So we took that from here. The second part is the parameters that we're going to be dealing with and that we're going to be sending to the server. And we took that from burp suit. And the third part is the way that burp suit is going to know whether this login is successful or unsuccessful. And we gave it capital F to tell it that this is what happens when the password is wrong. And we told it that you'll see a message called not logged in. So we're going to combine this with the command that we already had. So the command that we already had was Hydra, the IP, followed by the username that we're going to use, which is admin, followed by the password list. And we're going to put all of this after it. And that's it. That's our command done. I'm going to copy this. Paste it in here. And execute. And I forgot to tell it the type of the service that we're going to be attacking. So I only gave it the, I only gave it what it should send, but I didn't tell it what type of service we're going to attack. So like I said before, it's going to be HTTP post form. So it's the same service that we were inquiring about when we use the U option. So again, copy this, paste it here, hit enter. Now you can use the minus V option so that Hydra would actually display every request it sends to the server. I didn't use that right now. So all you see is literally just a blank screen, but we're going to wait for it until it finds the password for us. Hydra also supports 
pause and resume. So if you just control C out of this, the next time you run it, all you have to do is just put in minus R and that'll actually allow you to continue from where, we, where you left the last time. And as you can see now, we managed to find a valid username and password. And you can see that the username is admin and the password is admin pass. And this works against any web login. So it literally this web login doesn't re, doesn't need to have any SQL injections or JavaScript or XSS or anything. So now I can log in with the username admin and password admin pass. And as you can see now, I'm logged in as admin. So far, we learned how to manually discover a number of very dangerous vulnerabilities. We've seen how, to, how they work and how to exploit them. In today's video, I'd like to show you a tool that will allow you to automatically discover vulnerabilities in web applications. It will allow you to discover the vulnerabilities that we learned, plus much more. The reason why I didn't teach you this at the start because I wanted you to learn how to do it manually and I also wanted you to know how these vulnerabilities occur so to understand the reason behind them. Also these are just tools so this program is just a tool it can make mistakes and it can show false positives. It can also miss vulnerabilities in some cases therefore I wanted you to know how to do this stuff manually so if the program doesn't work or if the program misses something then you'll be able to find it. The best way to use these programs is as a backup or as just a tool to help you with your penetration testing. So using the tool is very simple. I'm gonna go on my applications and then I'm gonna type in zap. And it's asking me if I want to save the current session when I search for something. So I'm gonna say no. And this is the main view of the tool. So on the left here, you'll see the websites that you're targeting. On the right, you can attack and set the website URL. And in here, you'll see the results for your attacking or for your scan. If we go here on the cog on the left, it will allow you to modify the options for the program. So you can modify certain aspects of it, the way the fuzzer works, the way the spider works, the way the scan works. I'm gonna leave everything the same. Another thing that you can modify is the policies used in the scan. So it's something similar to the scans that we were using with Nmap, the intense scan and all that. So I'm gonna press on the plus, I'm gonna press on the active scan. And if you press on this on the left here, and I'm gonna press on the default policy. Now you can create your own policies by using the add button. I'm gonna press on the default one and I'm gonna go on modify to see you, to show you the aspects that you can modify. So right here you can modify the name, the threshold and the strength for the global policy. Clicking on each of these categories will allow you to modify the specific scans that will be performed. For example, in the injection tab here, we can see all the injection scans that the program is going to try. For example, we can see SQL injections here, you can see cross-site scripting here. And pressing on the threshold right here, we can set this to default, low, medium, or high. Setting it to the default will just default to the value selected here, which is medium right now. Or you can have, for example, if SQL injection is what you're looking for, if you're, what you're looking for is access for the database, then you can set this to high so that it'll try everything and it'll try to find it in even difficult places. So I'm gonna close all of this. I'm leaving everything the same. And I'm gonna start my attack against the Matilde script. So we have it in 10, 20, 14, 204, running in the Metasploitable machine. And if we go on Matilde right here, that's the URL. So literally, I'm just gonna copy this and paste it here. And then I'm gonna attack. Now the tool is first gonna try to find all the URLs and then it's going to try and attack these URLs 
based on the scan policy that we used. I'm gonna pause the video and resume it once the scan is over. So the scan is over now and you can see on the left here we have our website. Clicking on it will show you some results of the spider when it was looking for the files. The very interesting part is the alerts here. Right here you can see all the vulnerabilities that have been discovered. On the left here you can see that we have seven red flags. So these are the high priority alerts. We have three orange flags and five yellow flags and zero blue. So these are organized in the order of their severity. Clicking on any of these categories will expand it and show the threats that have been found related to that threat. For example, clicking on the path traversal, you'll see all the URLs that can be exploited to read files from the server. Clicking on any of these, you'll see the HTTP request that was sent in order to discover this. You'll see the response that why the tool thinks that this is vulnerable and we can see that in the response the tool was able to get the contents of etc password. Right here you can see the URL that the tool used to exploit this vulnerability. And in here you can see a description of what the current vulnerability is and how it has been exploited. In here you can see the risk of it, so this is very high. You can see the confidence, so how confident the tool about the existence of this vulnerability. You can see that it's been injected into a page and the attack is trying to get ETC password. So let's try and right click on this and open it in browser. And as you can see now it exploited it for us and it showed us the output for this vulnerability and we can read the contents of ETC password. And you can see that the exploit is being exploited in this URL right here. Let's have a look on another example. For example, across site scripting. And again, the tool also checks for post and get parameters. So sometimes when the parameter, when the injection is sent into text boxes or even sent without text boxes, if it's sent in a post parameter, you won't see it in the URL. So it actually checks for post and get. And you can see here it found a vulnerability in a post request in the register page. And it also found one in a get page. Again, right click and open in browser will execute it for us and we can see the code has been executed. Again, we can have the URL of the execution right here if we wanted to use it with Beef or any other tools. And we can see it in here as well, the URL that's being used to exploit this vulnerability. Let's just have one more example of an SQL injection. Again, click on it. It will show you why it believes that there is an SQL injection here. It will show you the URL and it will show you the attack that it used. It used and one equals one. And it's in the parameter password. And if you remember, we actually did exploit this parameter. Opening this in the browser will show us that the injection has been, is working and it's using a username and a password called zap. So the tool is very simple very powerful and very useful. You can play around with it. You can play around with the proxy and with the options and see how you can enhance the results and achieve even better results. So far in this course, we've seen how to discover and exploit a large number of vulnerabilities. We've seen how we can exploit these vulnerabilities such as SQL injections, file inclusion, and code execution, and even file upload, and get a reverse shell so that we'll actually have access to the server itself. In the file upload example, we were able to upload a Weavely shell, which gives us a lot of capabilities and a lot of features. In simpler examples like the code execution and in the SQL injection, we only managed to get a reverse shell.
So in this section, we're going to see how we can interact with the reverse shell with Weebly's shell. And we'll see what can we do now that we actually have access to the target server. So I'm going to start with the reverse shell because it doesn't give us as much capabilities as Weebly. And then we'll see how we can escalate that to a Weebly shell. And then we'll see what we can do after that. So first of all here, I'm just going to listen on port 8888. And so that I just want to get a reverse connection on this computer. Now I'm going to get my IP by running if config. And my IP is 10.20.14.213. So I'm just going to go to my DVWA and exploit the code execution vulnerability just so that we can have a reverse shell and then we'll see how we can interact with it. So I'm going to do this quickly because we've already spoke about it in the code execution lecture. So I'm just going to set the security level to low and then go on the command execution, make this bigger. And as you remember, we used to put an IP address, so I'm just going to put anything. And then semicolon and then the code that we want to run. And I want to get a connection using Netcat, so I'm going to do NCE. And then put the port. Now, this is the same code that we used in the SQL injection. We only wrapped this in PHP code. It's the same code that we used with the file inclusion vulnerabilities as well. So we'll actually be getting the same access as what we're getting in here when we exploit the other vulnerabilities, the SQL injection and the local file inclusion. So if we go here, now we actually have a complete bash shell. So we can run any bash commands we want. The exact same commands that we've seen in the Linux basics section at the start of this course. Now, in all of the previous lectures, we used to stop once we get to this point. And in the file upload, as I said, we got a Weebly shell, which gives us more, more capabilities. So the f for the first thing, I'm going to teach you what can you do now with this access, with the reverse shell access. Then once we know what you can do with that, we're going to see how you could escalate this and convert it to a Weebly shell, which allows you to get do more attacks or allow you to do more things on the target computer. Once we have a Weebly shell, so we'll be at the same level at, uh, as what you'd gain when you exploit a file upload vulnerability, we'll see what could you do with that. So you'll, you'll learn a large number of powerful attacks like running system commands, even if there is security on the target server. You'll learn how to navigate to other websites on the same server, read, f upload, and download files, uh, access the database, and bypass security measurements that might prevent you from doing these things. So in the next lecture, I'm going to start from here and we're going to keep building up on our access and we'll see what can we do on the target server. Now we actually have a complete bash shell. So we can run any bash commands we want. The exact same commands that we've seen in the Linux basics section at the start of this course. So I won't be going about how you do man and how you do help to see how you use the commands. I'm going to skip through that. And I want to show you a few commands that are useful when you first gain access to a server. So the first thing you want to check is what's my pri privileges at the moment. And the privileges depend on how you gained your access. So it depends on the page that you gained your access through. So we got our access through this current page. So depending on what privileges this page is running as, we will get the same privileges when we get our reverse shell. Same goes for SQL, same goes for everything really. So I'm going to do who am I. And as you can see now, my privileges are WW data. So I'm not root, I'm not admin, I'm not MSF admin, I'm WWW data. And this is very important because when you're root, you can do anything you want on the server. When you are another user, then you have less privileges or less permissions to do stuff on the current web server. So another thing that you want to check is the kernel version of the computer. So you can do uname A. And this will display a lot of information other than the kernel version. So you see the computer name 
and you can see the version of the kernel. Now, this is important if you're trying to run a local exploit to escalate your privileges to a higher privileges or maybe even get root privileges, which will give you access to do anything you want on the, on the whole server, not only on this website. Now, as I said, you can run any of the commands that we learned so far. So you can do ls to list the current files and we can see that there is help, index and source. You can do pwd to, say, to see where you are. And we are currently at var www dvwa vulnerabilities and exec. So you can navigate through these exactly the same way you'd navigate with a normal Linux system. So we can do a cd dot dot to go back, do a pwd. And we're at vulnerabilities again, cd dot dot, and another cd dot dot. Now, if I do a pwd, you'll see that I'm at var www, and this is the document root at the moment. So, if I do an lsl to get more information, and note, we can see here the permissions. And before the permissions, now, if you see, you see, notice that there is a d here. That D means that this is a directory, it's not a file. And when you don't see the D, that means it's a file in here. Now you can see that we have access to all the other websites. So we can access the TikiWiki website. We can also access the Matilday website. And you can access the DVWA right here. So what this shows you is if you manage to hack into any website, then most of the time you can actually navigate to the same websites on the same server. And this is what I said in the information gathering section. I said it's very important because sometimes your target website will not have any vulnerabilities, but you might find something on the same server. And from that, you can navigate to, to your website. So for example, we gained our access through DVWA. And let's say Matilda was our actual target, but we couldn't find anything in it. So we hacked into the server through DVWA and I can navigate now to Matilday. So I can just do CD Matilday. And then I can do an LSL to see the files. So you can remove files using the RM command. You can delete files. You can do anything you want really now in the other website in Matilday. Even though we never actually got access to Matilday, we got our access through DVWA. Now, one of the very important commands is cat, which allows you to read files. And one very important file that you always want to read is the etc password. Now we actually try to read this using the local file inclusion vulnerability, but I want to show you now. So if you do a cat etc password, you can see that we can read all the content of this file right here. And what this file has, it shows you the users installed on the current computer and it shows you the directory for these users. Now in this particular setup, all the websites are stored in var www. So they're stored in var www and then you can put dvwa to access the dvwi website or you can put matilday to access matilday. Most of the time you won't see this. In most websites, they actually create a user for each website. And the user usually corresponds to the website name. So for example, let's say your example, your target was Facebook, then the user would be called Facebook or Facebook user or something similar to that. So what you'd want to be doing is you want to go through this file and see the path for that for your target website. So let's say you hacked into this website through Google and Facebook is on the same server, then look for a user called Facebook and then just navigate to that file. Now you can see that the www data user right here, and you can see that it has its directory stored at var www. Again, if you open that, you'll see all the websites in here. So if we just do cd var, then you can list whatever you want. So the take on lesson from this is that on a reverse shell, you can basically run any command, any Linux command you have, depending on the privileges that you have. The privileges depend on the page or the source that gave you the access. So whatever pr privileges that resource is running, you'll actually get the same privileges, the same permissions. 
And once you're in a server, the server is just a computer. So once you gain access to that server, you can increase your privileges, you can escalate them and try to access other websites on the same server. How you access the other websites, it's in the ETC password. You list that and you see the user corresponding to your target website and just open their directory using the CD command. Now I'm gonna attach a list of the bash commands that you can run so that you can go through them, try them, and see how they work for you. I mentioned earlier that Weebly allow us to run a number of very useful functions on the target server if we manage to upload its shell to that server. So in this lecture, we'll see how we can convert our basic shell access to a Weebly shell. So I'm going to create, uh, first of all, I actually have connection here coming from my Metasploitable machine. And my privileges are just normal www data, as you can see. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna create my Weebly shell first. So we've done this in the file upload vulnerability. So it's very simple. All you have to do is just run Weebly and then generate to create a shell or create a backdoor. And then we're gonna have to, to set a password for that backdoor and I'm gonna set it to one, two, three, four, five, six. And then state where do you want to save it and I'm gonna save it in root. And I'm gonna ca call it shell. Now in the file upload vulnerability, we actually created the shell with PHP format. Right now, I'm not gonna create it in PHP because I have to download it from the Metasploitable machine. When PHP files are downloaded, the source code will not be downloaded with them. So if I create it as PHP and download it from the Metasploitable machine, it's not gonna work properly as I want it. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna call it, it as I'm gonna create it as TXT and then rename it once I download it at the Metasploitable machine. All I have to do now is upload it somewhere that is accessible by the Metasploitable machine. So in real life scenarios, you want to be able to upload it to somewhere where you can directly access the shell. In this lecture, because we're doing it in our local, com in our local environment, I'm actually gonna just put it in my web server in my Kali machine, which is accessible by Metasploitable. So I'm just gonna do CP to copy, and I'm gonna copy root shell.txt, and I'm gonna copy it to var www html, which is my document root in Kali. And I'm also gonna start my web server, so I'm just gonna do service, Apache 2, start. And now Apache is running, so I literally have, I basically have a web server now, which contains this current file. Let's see if the file exists. So I'm just gonna come here and I'm gonna go to my local host. So pretty much I can just do local host, but I'm gonna put my IP, which is 10, 20, 14, 213. And we called it shell.txt. As you can see now, we can see the code for the actual backdoor. This is very important. So when you upload it to a server, make sure that you can access the shell directly like this and make sure that when you access it, you can see the code without anything on the sides, with no ads, with no banners, with nothing showing up around it. So you can literally access the bare code. Once you do that and you have this URL, all you have to do is just download it from the Metasploitable machine. So at the moment, this is my Metasploitable machine. So if I do a uname A, just to confirm, you can see that I'm actually connected and inside the Metasploitable machine. So all I have to do is download it, but I can't download it anywhere. I need to download it somewhere, again, accessible by my Kali machine so I can connect to it. So you wanna, you wanna download it somewhere within the document route, within the var www or whatever document route your current website uses. So if I do a PWD, you can see that I'm inside var www dvwa vulnerabilities. So I'm gonna do cd back to go one, one step back. And if I do an ls here, 
you can see the files that we have in this current directory. Now, let's try to download the file in this current directory. Now, sometimes you won't be able to download files depending on your privileges or permissions. So I'm just gonna do a wget, and this is the download command. So wget can be used on Linux systems to download any files. So you literally just do wget, and, that you, and then you put the URL that you want to download. So the URL that we want to download is HTTP 10.20.14.2.13. And then we call the file shell.txt. Now I'm gonna give it some time to download. And then I'm gonna do an ls again. And as you can see, we have a file called shell.txt. Now this file is uploaded on the Metasploitable machine inside DVD, DVWA vulnerabilities. Again, if we do PWD, you can see that we have DVWA followed by vulnerabilities. So let's go and try to browse it in here and make sure that it exists. 10, 20, 14, 2, 12, which is, that's where our DVWA is. And then we're gonna go to vulnerabilities. And our file is called shell txt but I didn't put the dvwa before it and as you can see we can access the file now which is uploaded inside dvwa vulnerabilities we can see our shell.txt now again this is not good enough because it's not getting executed so now all we have to do is change its extension to php again and again, we're gonna do that from our basic shell access right here. So we're gonna do mv shell.txt to shell.php. And then do ls to make sure that the process was done properly. And we can see that our shell is called shell.php. Now we can connect to the shell using our Weavely client. So we're just gonna do Weavely give the shell URL. So our URL, the shell is stored now at HTTP. So this is where you uploaded the shell. So it's it's exactly the same URL as this, but with .php because we changed the file extension. I'm actually gonna copy this. And I'm gonna set this to PHP. And then we're gonna put the password, which is 123456. Make sure you put the same password that you set when you created the backdoor. Hit enter, and as we can, as you can see, we're inside the target computer. We're inside this target, and we can run all the commands that Weavely allow us to do. So we can just do an ls, a pwd, and all Linux commands plus all the commands that Weavely allow us to do, all the functions that Weavely allow us to do, which we're gonna have a look on in the next videos. In this video, we're gonna see how to interact with Weavely and some of the basic commands. So I'm gonna connect to the shell that we already uploaded in the previous video. So all I'm gonna do is Weavely, the URL where the shell is located, followed by the password. Gonna hit enter and I'm in. So the first thing we're gonna do is run the help command. So if you just type in help, you'll see all the commands that you can run using Weavely. So these are all the functions that you can do. So you can see the name of the function followed by the description of what that function does. So the first thing, the first thing that we're gonna have a look on is system info, which basically displays information about the current server that we have access to. So for any of these commands, all you have to do is type it and it'll run. Now some of them require options and we'll see how we do that. So the first thing you want to do before you even run the, the command is you just type the command. So in our case, it's system info. And then type minus H to see the options and the required. Some of them have required commands and some of them have only optional arguments that you can give. So for this one, you can specify what kind of information you want by putting minus info. But Generally, you can just run system info and it will show you information about the current operating system. So I'm just gonna run it normally. So I'm just gonna type system info. 
and as you can see it collects information about the current server so you can see the IP you can see where your shell is located you can see the folder where the shell is located you can see information about the operating system so you can see it's a Linux operating system you can see the kernel version and as I said before this is useful when you're trying to find local buffer overflow exploits so that you can escalate your privileges you can see where the config is and again we're going to talk about that in the future we can see the PHP version again very useful when you're trying to bypass functions when you're trying to exploit vulnerabilities and again we can see that it's a Linux operating system and our current user is www.data so it's the result of the who, who am I command and you can also see the document root which basically refers to the directory which Apache uses as its base so you can see that or we know already that in our metasploitable all the websites are stored in var www and then after that if you put dvwa you'll be in dvwa if you put metilda you'll be in metilda so again this is very important information if you're trying to navigate from web one website to another speaking of navigating from one website to another we've seen before how we can do cat etc password and that will give us the locations that will give us the users on the current operating system and their locations where the the document root is and i told you that you can use these locations to navigate within the server and go from one website to another Mithilde also have a function that will automatically display this information for you without doing cat etc password and the function is called if you just do the help the function is called audit etc password so again all you have to do is just type in audit etc password and before I run this again I'm gonna do the minus H to see the help and here you see why is this useful now you're gonna you might think that why would I even need this function all I have to do is just do cat etc password and I'll see the results why would I need this function why would I use it and what's handy in here is the vector argument so what this argument allow you to do is it specifies the method of reading that file because depending on how you gained your shell access depending on the configuration on the server on the web applications on the current user and a lot of variables you might not be able to read what's inside that file so you might do cat etc password and you will get nothing or you will get permission denied so what's useful with this command is you can specify a number of methods to read that file and these the methods are listed in here in the vector argument and if you can't get it with one method then just try the next one so I'm going to show you how to do this now and this is very useful because you have this vector argument with a lot of the functions in Weavely and it's really handy because as I said depending on the permissions some of the functions might not work and you can just use a different vector and it'll work so for our example we can just do audit etc password and this will actually work but what I want to do is I want to show you how to use the vector in case that didn't work for you so all you have to do is just put in the vector argument followed by the vector that you want to use so an example would be file right here so all we have to do is just type in file and we can see that this particular vector didn't work so we can just try a different vector and we're gonna go with fread again this one didn't work so we try another one and let's go with the file get contents again no log let's go and try posix get pwuid and here we go so like I said in your example or in your case try all the vectors some of them will work some of them might not work depending on the configuration so it's really handy option to use if the normal cat etc password didn't work 
So we already seen in previous lectures how we can run Linux commands on the target server. All you have to do is just literally type in the command. For example, we can type in pwd to see where we are. We can navigate back, cd dot dot. Uh, we can list what we have and we can do anything we want on the target server. Unfortunately, this isn't, this isn't always the case. In many cases, you might gain access, upload your shell, and have Weebly working, but every time you run a command, you won't see the result, or you might get permission denied. And this will happen because the server is configured in a way to prevent you from running commands on that server. So, what we're going to do is we're going to use a function that comes in with Weebly. So, let's first type in help to see all the functions or the commands that we can use. And the function that we're gonna use is called shell sh. And as you can see in the description, it says it allows us to execute shell commands. So using the function is very simple. All you have to do is type in shell sh, and then type the command that you wanna run. So you can type in again, pwd, and you'll see the current working directory. Now, this will just use the default way that we've been using so far anyway. So if the default way doesn't really work, this will probably not work for you either. What I want to show you here is what this function allows you to do. So it actually allows us to run Linux commands using a number of methods. So it's very similar to the idea of the etc password when we were reading it. In this case, if you can't run commands on the target server, then it's probably because your user is configured in a way that's not allowed to run bash commands. So what this function allows us to do is run the command through a PHP function or through a Python function or through a Perl function. So this way you're actually not running the command directly. You're, you're running a PHP function and then the PHP function itself runs the command. Therefore, if you don't have permission to run commands directly, you'll be able to bypass this by running the command through a PHP function. So to see all the vectors or all the methods that we can use to run the command, we're gonna do shell sh followed by minus h. And as you can see, the first thing you see is the general way of using the command. So you type in shell sh, and then you type where you want the command to be displayed. This is the redirection, and we're not gonna mess with that because we want it to be displayed on screen. After that, you specify the vector. So this is what we're talking about. This is the methods that you can use to run the shell commands. And you can see that you can run it using system. So this is the default way of running the commands. You can also use a pass, a PHP pass through function. So this is the one that we used to use when we were executing commands using PHP, remember, in the code execution vulnerabilities. Again, you have a number of PHP functions. So if one of the functions is disabled, you can use the other one. You can also run commands using Python through the Python interpreter. And you can run functions using the Perl interpreter. So to use this, we're going to use the same command, shell sh, followed by minus b, just like we see here in the template. So it's telling us first thing you type in is the command, followed by the vector. And we're going to choose a vector to use. And for the first one, let's try the Perl system. So we're going to use Perl system. So this is the actual function that will execute the command that we specify. And you can see here in the template, so it's shell sh followed by the vector, followed by the command that we want to run. And let's run this time, we're gonna try to run who am I. Hit enter. And as you can see, this doesn't work. So we're gonna go back and we're gonna change the vector. And let's try to use pass through. And we know pass through works because we used it before. So again, we're using pass through as a vector and we're running the command who am I? Hit enter. And as you can see now, the command got executed on the server. So again, in our particular case here, this doesn't seem very useful because we can run commands normally, just we can just type in who am I? But in a lot of real case scenarios, you won't be able to run commands directly like this and using this function with the vector could be very useful. So all you have to do is just use this shell sh and experiment with all the available vectors until one of them works for you. So we're still inside Weebly. And in this lecture, we're gonna see how we can upload and download files 
from the target system. At the moment I'll be running some shell commands and I'm gonna look for a file that's interesting for me so well, the first thing we're gonna do is download the file and I'm gonna do pwd and you can see that I'm in var www.dvwa I'm gonna do an ls to see all the files right here uh, and we can see that there is a directory called config and the config directories are or if you see a file called config or a directory called config, then chances are it contains important information. Most of the time it contains information about connecting to the database. So I'm gonna navigate to that directory using the cd command. And then I'm gonna list to see what I have. And you can see that we have a file called config.inc.php. Now we can try to read this using the cat command and we can try to read it using the functions that come with uh, Weavly, but this is not what we're interested in in this lecture. Uh, let's see how we can download this file so we can read it on our local machine. Now remember, you can't actually browse through this file. So if we go here to the server and if we go to dvwa config, and you see that there is a config file, but if we click it, you'll see that you can't actually read it because it's written in PHP and PHP files cannot be read remotely. So even if you view the source, you'll see that it's empty. It has no lines whatsoever. So let's go back and we're gonna use the download. So the download is called file download. And then I'm going to put minus H to see how to use it because I don't know how to use it. So just I want you to see the idea of how you use all of these functions. You put the function name minus H to see how to use it. And you can see that the way to use it is you literally just specify a file download. You can specify the vector. So this is similar to when we were doing when we were reading the etc password or executing the shell sh ex executing shell commands. So you can specify the method of reading of downloading the file because sometimes maybe the basic download method will not work for you. So you can just do minus vector and you specify the vector that you want. So in this example, I'm just going to use the default one. I'm not going to specify a vector. So again, we're going to do file download our path, which is the remote path. So the file on the server that you want to download, followed by the location that you want to download it to on your local machine. So the command is going to be file download. The remote path is going to be config.inc.php. And I want to store it in my root. So this is on my actual local machine. It's going to be stored in root. And I'm going to call it config downloaded. And I'm going to make it a txt. So you can actually put it a PHP if you want, but I'm going to make it a txt in my case. So the command is very simple. It's file download followed by the file, the full path or the location where the file is located. And the file for me is located in the carrot working directory and it's called config.inc.php. And I want to download it to my root config downloaded.txt. So I'm going to call it config downloaded.txt. And if I want it, if this command didn't work for me, then I can just do add a vector by doing minus vector and specify the way that I'm gonna download it. So I can just specify the, all the methods that we have here. So we have file, we have fread, file get, and base64. So I'm just gonna use the file. And that's it, the file should be downloaded. So let's go to our file manager. And we're already in the root. And you can see that there is a file called config downloaded.txt. If we double click it, you'll see the information that was saved in that file. And remember when we went on the browser, nothing was displayed. When you go here, you'll see that you can see everything because we actually downloaded the source code for the file. Now, let's see how we can upload files to the server. So uploading files can be very useful because you can use it to literally upload anything you want. So you can upload any PHP script that you want. PHP scripts can be used to do anything. You can use it to gain a reverse shell. You can use it to execute commands on the server. You can use it to 
connect to the database and browse through the files and you can even use it to exploit local vulnerabilities such as buffer overflows and code execution. So the possibilities are endless really. One thing to note is that now when I check my privileges, so if I do who am I to check the current user, you'll see that I'm the www data. And the current website is running under that user. So basically I can do anything I want on this website because I am the owner on, of this website at the moment. In a lot of the cases, depending on how you gained your access to the website, your privileges might be nobody. So when you do your who am I, instead of getting www data, you'll be who you'll be nobody. And when you're nobody, you can't upload anywhere you want. You can only upload to directories that has 777 permissions. So to directories that basically allow anybody to upload to them. So if you do ls la, you can see that we have all, all of our files. And you can see that all of them are owned by www data, which is me. So this is the parent directory, and this is the current directory. And these are just normal directories and files in the current working directory. And you can see that all of them are owned by me. Therefore, I can upload anywhere. But what we're going to do in this lecture, we're going to pretend that we can't upload anywhere. We're going to pretend that I am nobody. And if I wanted to upload something while being nobody, we have to upload it to a place where everybody is allowed to upload files. And that place would should have a 777 permissions. So these are the permissions here. And what they look like is they should look like this. So there should be no minuses in it. And it will basically mean that everybody can do anything. They can read, write, and execute. So we can see from the directories here. Now the directory start with a D in the permission. So we can see that from the directories here, we have nothing with 777 permissions. So we actually have to look around. I'm sorry, I clicked control C there. So I'm just going to go back and connect back to Weavely. So again, we're going to do PWD and we're, we're in var www.dvwa. And where I want to go is we can see an interesting directory here called hackable. So let's go in it and then let's see what's in there. So we're going to go into hackable using cd command. And then again, we're going to do lsl. And again, there is nothing really interesting here. So let's go back. And we're going to navigate back again. And if we list here, you'll see that we are in the root directory and we can navigate to different websites now. And if you notice, we have a directory called dav here. Now this directory doesn't belong to us. It actually belongs to the root user. So it doesn't belong to www data, which is us, but we can actually upload stuff here. Why? Because it has the permissions that allow everybody to upload. So it has 777 permissions, which look like this. So we're going to navigate into that place. CD dav. We're going to list to see if there is anything already there. And we can see that there is no files whatsoever there. So we're going to upload our file and we're going to use a function called file upload. We're going to do the minus H like, us like usual. And you can see that the way you use this function is you type in file upload first. You can use the minus F to force overwrite to overwrite the file if it exists already. You can specify the file content and you can specify the vector. And again, the vector is the method of how the file is going to be uploaded. And I'm going to keep this the default. So I'm not going to use the minus vector. And then you give the local path. So where the file is stored on your current computer on our Kali machine, followed by the remote path. So where do you want the file to be stored on the target server? So the file that I want to upload is located in my root. So if we go to the 
file manager, you'll see that I have the file in the root and it's just called test.txt. It's actually a shell, but it's just called test.txt. So we'll try to upload that. Um, so our local directory is gonna be root test.txt. And we want to upload that to the remote path of the current path. So if you want to specify the current place, the current working directory where you are, you just have to put a dot followed by a forward slash. So this is where we want to upload it. And then we have to give it a name. So I'm going to call it shell or test shell uploaded.txt. Just a name so we know that the file has been uploaded correctly. So again, the command is very simple. It's file upload. You specify where the file is stored on your current machine and mine is stored in root and it's called test.txt. And then you specify where you want to upload it. And I'm gonna upload it to the current working directory. That's why I have a dot forward slash. And then followed by the name that I wanna call it. So I'm gonna call it test shell uploaded.txt. I'm gonna hit enter. And you can see that it's given us a true statement, which means that the file has been uploaded. If we do an ls, you'll see that the file has been uploaded to this particular directory. So now we can go to our web browser and we uploaded the file to a directory called dav and then we called it test shell uploaded.txt. And as you can see now, we can see the file has been uploaded and this is the actual content of the file. It's an encrypted shell, so it has been uploaded perfectly or correctly. And again, we uploaded it to a directory that doesn't belong to us, but the main idea is the directory has to have 777 permissions and that way, even if you have a nobody, even if you are nobody, you can upload to that directory. If the directories have your permissions, like the www data here, all these directories, we can upload to them regardless of the permissions they have because we are www data. So what I showed you here is just an example of how you would upload files if you had nobody permissions. In this lecture, we'll see how we can get a reverse connection from our Weavely shell. So at the moment we uploaded Weavely and we're connecting to it directly using this URL. So when we hit enter, we're actually just doing a direct connection and it's as if we're just interacting with a normal PHP script uploaded on that directory. So what we want to do is maybe in some cases you can't really run commands like this. So right now I can run whatever command I want, whatever Linux command. We also seen how we can use the shell sh function that comes with Weavely to try and bypass if we can't run commands. If none of that works, or if you wanted just an actual direct reverse connection from the target web server to our machine, then you can follow what I'm going to do in this lecture. It can be really handy because you'll have a direct connection and you'll be able to bypass a lot of security measurements. So. We're gonna do help first to see the options that we have. And the function that I wanna to use today is the reverse, where is it? Backdoor reverse TCP. And it basically just gives you a reverse TCP shell. So it won't be executed through a PHP. It will be a reverse shell, reverse connection coming from the target server towards your computer. And because of that, it will bypass firewalls because the connection is coming out of the web server, not to the web server. So the first thing we're gonna do is, as usual, we're just gonna run backdoor, reverse TCP, and I'm gonna put minus H to see the options that we can get with this function. And you can see the way to use it is the first thing you need to specify the name of the function followed by the type of shell. So we're gonna leave that the same. You can tell it not to auto connect, but we don't want that. We actually want it to automatically connect. And then you can specify the vector. And again, the vector is very important and it specifies the way the reverse connection will be spawned. So you can use netcat. It can be done through netcat. It can be done through Python. It can be done through Perl, Ruby. These are all programming languages. So if the connection doesn't, if the target server doesn't 
have netcat installed or if it has certain security or permissions that prevent you from using netcat then you can try to get your shell through python if python is not installed or if it has some sort of measurements that prevent python from connecting back to you then you can do it through perl and again if perl is configured in a way that it's not allowed to spawn reverse connections you can do it through ruby and again you can use any of these vectors until one of them works for you and once one of them work for you chances are you're going to be able to bypass a lot of security measurements uh, definitely you'll be able to run bash commands on the target server so if the if you can't run bash commands normally and if you tried the shell sh function that we seen in an earlier video and still didn't work for you then you should come to this try this method if it works then you'll be able to run any shell commands you want on the target server so let's try it in action so we're gonna type in backdoor reverse tcp we're gonna give it the vector and I'm gonna want to use netcat and then we're gonna give it dependent on this as you can see so we did that and we gave it the vector then we need to give it our local host so the IP address of our current computer followed by the port that we want the connection to be done through so to get the IP address of my computer I'm just gonna run if config And you can see that my IP address is 10 20 14 213. So I'm going to close this. And then we're going to give it the port and I'm going to set the port to 8080. So the command is very simple. Backdoor reverse TCP vector, which is going to be netcat. And then we put our current IP address followed by the port that we want the connection to be done through. I'm going to hit enter. And now the connection is established. So now we can run any commands we want. And keep in mind that these commands will be executed through netcat. So the connection is coming back now from the server to us. And now we're communicating with it through a completely different port. It's not going to go through Weavely. It's actually going to go through netcat. So if there was some sort of security that didn't allow us to run commands through Weavely, then we'll be able to bypass them now. So now we can use it, we're going to do PWD, for example. And we have to add a semicolon after it. You can see that where we are, we can do a who am I. Seems like we lost our connection, so I'm just going to do it back. So again, we can do a who am I. We can pretty much do any command we want. Now again, if this didn't really work for you, you can go ahead and try a different vector. You can try the Python, you can try the Perl. After each of these vectors, try to see who am I and see the current permissions or the current user that you're running as, because you might actually be running under a different user. One thing to keep in mind here is your IP. Because the connection is, is a reverse connection, so it's coming back from the target web server to your computer. Therefore, at the moment, I'm actually using a private IP within my current network, but it works because the website is on the same network. If I was doing this against a real website, this won't work because my private IP is not accessible publicly because it's hidden behind the router. So if you want to receive connections, if you want to receive reverse connections from an actual web server and if you're not on the same network as that web server then you need to either set up your Kali machine as a DMZ host or you need to enable IP forwarding to enable the port, the port that you're using here so 8080 in this case to be forwarded to your private IP. You can do both of these things from the control panel of your router your router is usually located at the first IP. So my IP now is 10, 20, 14, 2, 13. The router is usually at the first IP, so it will be at the one. So you can access that through the browser, look for the option called DMZ, and set the Kali machine as a DMZ host. Another option is to go to port forwarding, add a rule to forward port 8080, 
to the IP of the Kali machine. Also make sure the IP the Kali machine is connected to your actual network and it's not set up as a NAT network like this. So make sure you have a wireless card connected to your home network and from there you will have an actual IP in your network instead of a private virtual IP like we have here. A lot of the time we'd be interested into more than just hacking into the website. So at the moment we can read, write, download, modify files on the current web server. But a lot of the time what actually interests us is data that is stored in the database. So things like usernames and passwords, you won't see them into files, they'll actually be stored into the database. So if you want to see these things, if you want to have access to them, you have to hack into the database. Most of the programs, for example, DVWA, Matilda, and real world programs like WordPress, they all connect to the database to store stuff in it. And in order to be able to connect to the database, they do that through a file called config. So there's usually it will be called config.php, cfg.php, or something similar to that. So the first thing you want to do is you want to locate that file and read its content. So this is what we're going we're going to do. This is going to be our step one. So we are in var www.dav. So I'm just going to go to dvwa. So I'm going to go back once and go to dvwa and then I'm going to list and you can see that we have a directory called config. So we're going to open that directory and we're going to list and you can see that we have a file called config.inc.php. So you can read that using the normal cat command. So you can literally just do cat config.inc.php and you'll be able to read the contents. A lot of the times when you do that it's not going to work. So what you want to do is you can do you can use a function that comes in with Weavely. Again, it's called file read and it allows you to read the file using multiple methods. So if the normal cat method didn't work for you, you can use that function to read it. And let's see how we can use that function. So we're just going to do file read minus h like we always do and you can see that we have a number of vectors so we can do an f read on it we can do file get and you can get it in base 64 so again you can use you can use that similarly to the ways that we were doing it before so you just do minus vector and we're going to choose file and then you select the file that you want to read which is again it's called config dot inc dot php and once we read this file, you'll see that it has information about how to connect to the database. So this file is actually used by the web application itself to connect to the database. So you always see these four things. You'll see that the host, and you can see that it's set to the local host here. You can see the database name, it's called dvwa. The username is root and the password. And in this case, it's blank. Chances are you won't see a root user and you won't see a blank password. So you'll probably have like some sort of a name in here and you'll actually have a password in here. Once you have this information, you can connect to the database using an SQL shell. So if we go back to the help here, you'll see that we have two SQL modules. One of them is the SQL console. And this one will basically allow you to have a normal an interactive SQL console where you can run any SQL statement. Something similar to what we got with SQL map. This will not work in this case because our root user is not using any passwords. So it'll just not connect. But in normal cases, it should work for you. The second example, which is the more useful example anyway, is the SQL dump. And this will basically dump the whole database into a file and it'll download the file to your current computer so that you can open it and read the data normally using a text editor. So we're going to have a look on this example on the SQL dump. So using, using these modules is very similar to what we've been doing so far. So the SQL console is very similar to the module anyway. So we're going to do SQL dump. 
and we're going to do a minus H to see how to use it. And you can see that the way to use it is you do SQL dump, you select the database type, you don't have to do that, we're not going to do it. You give it the host, so let's give it the host. And this is going to be localhost. Again, we're taking this information from here, from the config file. After the host, you want to give it the LPath. And this is where the data is going to be saved in your local computer. So let's store it in root. And we're going to call it dvwa data dot txt. And then you want to select the vector. So I'm going to leave this the way it is and we're not going to modify that. And then we're, you have to select the database. Again, we'll take this information from here. So the database is dvwa. Then you have to give it the user. So the user is root. And my password is blank. So again, the command is SQL dump, giving it the host, where we want to store the data. And then the database is dvwa, the user is root, password is blank. Hit enter. And I did something wrong here. I forgot to put minus L path in here. Hit enter. And now it's telling us that this method has failed. So again, when something fails, we go, we try a different vector. So let's try to use my SQL dump sh. So we're going to use the same command, but we're going to add minus vector to it. And this is going to be my SQL dump sh. Hit enter. And as you can see now, this worked. And it's telling us that the data has been stored to root dvwa-data.txt. So I'm going to go to my file manager. And I'm already in root. And you can see that we have a file here called dvwa-data.txt. Double click the file. And right here we can see information about the whole database. So it might look like gibberish, but it's not. If you just have a closer look at it, you can see that you have the table structure. You have a table here called guestbook. You can see that this table has the following columns. It has a column called comment ID. It has a column called comment and it has a column called name. And you can see that the primary key is the comment ID going down. You'll see that we have a table called users. You can see the columns are user ID, first name, last name, user, password, and avatar. And if you go down, you'll actually see the entries. So you can see that we have a user called admin, and this is their password. This is their working directory. Again, you have another user called Gordon. His second name is Brown. And this is his password. Now the passwords are encrypted, so you can go and try to decrypt these passwords. But again, this lecture just show you how to gain access to the database and dump the whole database into a local storage and then browse it the way you want. These are actual dump files, so you can actually import them into phpMyAdmin. So if you have a web application background, you can go to phpMyAdmin, create a new database, and import this file into that database. It will automatically create a database with these tables and you'll be able to easily navigate through this and read the data.